And we'll record this and Hopefully everything will work out. I'm hoping the recording will work because I think it tries to record it to the C drive and I may not have enough space on the C drive. Try Tant Camtasia recording it too. So, no promises about the uh, recording. I hope it'll work. I just remembered, yeah, the this thing records to the C drive. My C drive may be a bit full. I hope not. We'll see. Anyway, that's why I always like to have a plan B. Should be starting here in just a minute. And welcome aboard, everybody, to our Trading Success Summit here for our January 28th. We'll be doing these at the end of each month for the entire year as a plan. So the last Saturday of the month with different speakers, or mostly different speakers each time. So I just see folks here. Okay, hopefully Anka will be here. I don't see her yet. Hmm. Anka Metcalf is supposed to be here at the hour at 12. Hopefully she'll show up here any second. Anka, if you're out there, let me know. <sighs> Always stressful to get these things lined up because I have so many different people lined up as speakers. And Dan's here. Hey, Dan. Hey, what's up, man? How are you today? Hey, uh, Dan. Uh, let's say uh, we're on a live mic, so. Uh, good to see you here, man. Uh, but yeah, you're up at one o'clock in an hour from now. We've got Anka is supposed to be here right now, but she's not showing up. Um, oh, okay. But yeah, good to see you here. We've got a live mic, so everyone can hear us. So welcome aboard. Uh, Dan Passarelli is here. So thanks for showing up, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to. And I look forward to chatting with everyone uh, in about an hour. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, it was, I don't know where Anka's at. Hmm. It's always something, right? It is indeed always something, my friend. <laughs> never, after 20 years of doing these, it's uh, <laughs> never changed as well. Hmm. Maybe Anka will show up eventually. Yeah. Well, if she doesn't, that's okay. I will jump into it and and do my best to cover for her as we yeah. get started. Well, you've always got good things to say, my friend, so... Well, thanks. You're very kind, Dan. I appreciate it, man. I try. It's a, all these years of learning, and it's still a challenge. I, you know, trading never gets easier. I, <laughs> I wish the heck it did, but it's still a real pain and it's real difficult. And you learn the, you know, the patterns. You learn the trade management stuff that works, but it never gets easy. So that's kind of the good news and bad news. Is good news you can learn patterns that work out frequently, and you can do reasonably well with them when they line up. But it's it never gets easy. What do you think, Dan? Trading never gets easy, does it? 
No, and I, I would go as far as saying that's the good thing about it. Always keep you on your toes. And man, I tell our student traders all the time, as soon as you stop learning, you're done. Just give up. <laughs> that's very true. Yeah, it's a, that's one thing I do love about trading. You're right. It's a keep this honored. Always uh, keeps your, your mind sharp, right? You're always trying to solve new puzzles every day. So, <laughs> Yep, yep. I love it. <laughs> good stuff. Well, I am looking for Ank even in the participants list or the regular... I don't see her here. Thank you. If you're out there, let me know. <laughs> if not, I will cover for her. Coming right up. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like she's here. Dan, let me go ahead and put you on uh, mute, sir, if you don't mind, or if you can mute yourself. That's just so we don't have any yep. uh, extraneous noise in the background and I will uh I will go ahead and get started with today's event. Sounds great. Talk to you soon. Okay. See you then. Thanks. All right, traders. Well welcome to our trading success summit for today, Saturday, uh January twenty eighth, two thousand and twenty three. I wanted to wish everybody the best for a happy new year. Uh, our regularly scheduled speaker is Anka Metcalf, but I don't see her here today, so something may have Happen. I don't see an email or anything, so let's go ahead and get started anyway. We're going to go ahead and jump in, and I'll cover for her, and I and our second speaker, uh, uh, we'll see where, where they are coming up. So anyway, let's get underway here as we get started. Let me start off by asking, how many of you are day traders, how many of you are swing traders, or how many of you do both? And that will help me tailor my presentation. I'll go ahead and jump in and cover right now. Are you guys mostly day or swing traders or both? Yeah, if somebody could maybe contact Anka if anybody's out there can help. Okay, we're seeing a lot of both, both swing, swing, both day. Wow, a lot of wow, big turnout today. Wow, thanks everyone for showing up. Both is this being recorded? Yes, day. Day trader, we've got both day and swing. Okay, so we've got a lot of both. I want to start off with swing trading because that's something that a lot of traders have in common, and then we'll delve into some day trading patterns as well. Let me ask one more question. What's your say? What's the biggest challenge you've got as a trader? What's one thing that would be particularly useful for you to learn? I did over forty-one million dollars worth of trades last year with PL proof, my Fidelity ten ninety nine. Uh, with my social security number covered up or what that, you know, for privacy, but that's on the front of my trademastery.com website. So proof that I really do trade. I don't just talk about this stuff. I'm the real deal. I've learned a whole lot, but like I was telling uh, Dan Passarelli just a minute ago, it never gets easy. And he totally agreed, right? It's a, what, what does get easier is the pattern recognition skill. What doesn't get easier is the pain in the ass of scanning uh, and reacting in real time and trade management. That stuff never gets easier. The pattern recognition stuff, relatively easy on the front. Well, it takes a lot of years, but once you have your patterns down, it's relatively easy. It's the rest of it that's you know, like find, finding through a lot of detailed scanning work, which charts are the best and how to manage entries and exits and all the rest of it. That's, that's the real pain, so. All right, well, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let me turn my camera on so you guys can see me and we will get underway here. Thanks for your patience. I was waiting for Anka. Hey, so can everyone see me? It'd be nice if I had a house like this. That's the virtual background. Uh, anyway, uh, happy Saturday, one and all. It's good to see so many of you here from around the world. I'm Ken Calhoun, founder of the original Day Trading University back in the 90s and now Trade Mastery. In case anyone's wondering, I pretty much stopped the Day Trading University because I have so many swing traders. And I own swingtradinguniversity.com too, but too much work. So trade mastery, short and sweet. Anyway, let's take a look at our charts and we'll get underway here. Now, if we start off with a look at the S&P, you can see, put this out of the way here. S&P is recovering. It is showing a shooting star, a bearish upper shadow at previous resistance. So a shooting star is confirming prior resistance. Be sure to learn candles from my colleague at Steve Nissen at candlecharts.com. I've learned so much from Steve. He's brilliant. He really is. And what he teaches actually works a lot of the time for me. So, uh, you know, here's a hammer. There's a shooting star. Uh, we've been moving up. Now, how many of you share my 
uh, kind of surprised of the run up the last couple of days. Tesla had been strong earlier, but with earnings misses in Intel and Microsoft, I was expecting technology, large cap tech usually leads the market down if they miss. And with a recession coming up, I was expecting the market would go down, not up yesterday. So just goes to show after all these years, common sense, right? Microsoft, bad news. Intel, bad news. A lot of other places, bad news. Economy, bad news. A lot of bad news, but yet the market goes up. So all we can do is trade it, right? If it goes up, we buy. If it goes down, we sell. Let's take a look at some Rockstar charts. Well, first thing I want to take a look at before that is the VIX. And you can see our volatility index is down to 18. I'm using 20 as kind of the R1, 20's resistance, 18 support. Uh, it's been channeling down here for quite some time. The VIX is over, long overdue for a, rest, a move back to the upside. So do have your eyes open for uh, volatility. Uh, we can stay long the market. I say cherry pick and go long in charts like Tesla that are doing great as long as the VIX stays under 20. But if we cycle back up over that, that key threshold, the 20 in the, the Chicago Board of Exchange Volatility Index, the VIX gets over 20, I'm going to fade out of long positions and instead go into some of the inverses that have gone down. Now let's take a look at a few Rockstar swing trading charts, and then we'll look at some intraday charts, and then we will go from there. This is one thing that I cover in my, normally my Saturday events uh, anyway, which is the trading week ahead. And we look at some of the very best swing and intraday charts for everybody's benefit. And also I ask you guys for your tickers. So if you have any tickers, a big turnout. Uh, if, if any of you have tickers, uh, do let me know what they are. If you have any questions, let's see. I have Q&A lit up. I don't know how to use Q&A. Uh, talk in the chat. Talk in the chat, please. I'm typing in some tickers from a few of you guys who are typing these in. If you if you have a chart you want me to pull up and give you my honest best, would I trade it or not, first of all, and then if so, how, uh, let me know, and we'll take a look. Anyway, VIPS looks good. Uh, one thing that you'll find characterizes winning stock charts, and my most profitable years, and I have had profitable years, I've had losing years too, and everything in between, but the best years I've had uh, for swing trades are ones in which I have this kind of chart. We've got a relatively wide, uh, how to say, a tall trading range, you know, like from three to eight, that's a big range. Range is critical, but so is consistency of the dang chart. So I don't know about you, but it's frustrating as heck to get into a chart and directionally you're correct. Eventually it keeps going up, but not before you get shaken out. A couple of times you take a couple of shots and you get shaken out and then it runs up without you. It's very disappointing to me, at least personally, and it may be disappointing to you too. So to kind of reduce the likelihood of that, I like charts like this that are like a piece of rope that's tied tight and a nice uptrending channel that doesn't have big wavy pullbacks up and down. Uh, they're difficult to find, but there's a whole bunch of them right there, right? This, this is a good list. Seabay looks good. We have a tweezer top up there, so we don't want to go long till over 850. Now, another quick tip to help you avoid false breakouts is you should, I, I never buy the obvious, what the street calls dumb money or public money, the breakout above the horizontal resistance line. Uh, and I also never buy anything with the number nine in it for what it's worth. Uh, so this one I would buy it, but only if it gets over 10. Uh, so you should never, or I never, I, you should never say never, but very rarely would you ever buy something right above the resistance. Give it some, what I call a safety buffer for stocks under 20 or $30 maybe 20 cents above the whole number or 20 cents above the current high before you get in to avoid the shakeout. So it's a nice clean chart going from six to almost 10 to 960. So that's a good range and good volatile chart. And most importantly, it's consistent. Now range can act as a double-edged sword, much like leverage can. What I found in my own trades is, uh, charts with too much range. For example, I would not swing trade uh, some of the, like the cheap stocks are like $3 stocks that go from $3 to $5 and back down to $3. That's too risky. I prefer charts like this that are 10, 15, 20, $30 a share or up that are steady in their, their progression of price action. Now let me give you one of my very favorite breakout patterns. And that's this one right here. We've got a small candle followed by a large candle, okay? Let's check in our attendance here. 
So anyway, the pattern is thus, <laughs> is thus. You have a bitty, it's not a, you don't want a doji flat candle, that's uncertain, but you want a small green candle with a small green, relatively small for that chart, a whole real body candle followed by a larger green candle parked right above it. You go along above the second candle and it often makes like this. If you bought the 10 and a half, well, right here at the 11 or so above that particular pattern, that was good for a really big run. That's one of my favorite patterns. I've taught traders for over 21 years now, uh, and I've tested out myself extensively. And that's one of my favorite patterns. Now it has to be in an existing uptrend. It's not a pattern that's necessarily, I wouldn't say it's bad in a downtrend, but I would focus on an uptrending instrument. Oh, hey, Auntie. So anyway, make note of that pattern. Small candle, large candle, and an uptrend you go long above the high. If I see any great patterns here for you guys, I'll, I'll holler. I'll tell you, tell you about them and how they work. Here's small candle followed by large candle. And even if you miss it, you had another small followed by large candle. And if you, even if you miss that second one, you had a third example of a small candle followed by a large candle. Now, a lot of times when it comes to active trading, a lot of the chart patterns are a lot like a hidden word search puzzle. If you've ever done those back when I used to travel around the world for client gigs uh, in the airports back in the old days before the cell phones are popular, we'd get, you know, puzzle books at the at the uh, newsstand, uh, you know, the word search puzzles where you've got all those letters and then there's a hidden in there is different words you circle. Sound familiar? That's kind of like how these dang charts are. Uh, until you know what to look for, until you have the answer key uh, and you have the word circled for you, it's, it's hard to, to see it at first glance. So for those of your fellow old school folks like me, I just turned 59, so I'm almost 60. I'm getting old, 59. Uh, but anyway, I digress. The point is small, large. I don't really like dojis, but that's still an example of pattern small. Large. That's, so maybe technically we say that's not an example, though it is. That's an example of the pattern, and that qualifies as an example. And this one too, for that matter. Now, from a trade management standpoint, one technique that I've pioneered and tested over many years, you may have seen my articles, my award-winning articles in Stocks and Commodities Magazine is the two-day two -day high-low method. And that's simply where you're building a position or going long if the, uh, if the thing that you're trading uh, whether it's a stock or an ETF or whatever, closes the day above the previous day's high in an uptrend. Uh, you scale in or build an initial trade that way. And on the flip side, if it's going down, you don't have to sell the whole thing, but start scaling out, maybe a quarter or a third of the position, up to half a position, uh, if it loses two-day support. So for example, if you'd been in here and here and here, you'd sell it here, okay, and it kept going down. You dodged a bullet, it goes up, you get back in. So. If things lose a two-day low, you start to scale out progressively. And if they break out above a two-day high, you scale in. Now, scaling and position sizing is one thing that uh, I learned from my colleague, the unfortunately uh, late uh, departed uh, Dr. Van Tharp. And Van was a great guy. He was a very nice person, too. He was a really nice guy. We talked on the phone, and, he, and his books, uh, like uh, The Matrix or Trading Beyond the Matrix, his books and knowledge on position sizing are extremely valuable, and I recommend them. Now, how many of you, I don't, hey, you go, yeah, I don't know where, where Anka's at. I, I, I don't see her in the panelist thing, and I don't see a, uh, I don't see a, an email from her. So unfortunately, I guess she couldn't make it. So I'll invite her back. Uh, or if somebody knows, uh, if somebody uh, can uh, contact her, that'd be great. Anyway. So anyway, two-day high and low. So if you're looking at a high above the previous day's high, that's where you scale in. And a two-day low, you go in under the second-day low. And hey, Gal, yeah, I, I do not know. All right, what do we have? Let's see. Now, if you guys would, please uh, go ahead and type in any uh, tickers you'd like me to pull up. Let's see. 
we will take a look. Anyway, let's take a look at some other charts. Here's another one, KWeb. And what you're looking for is a sequence of trades. That's another quick tip that I'd encourage you to think about. Whenever I put on a trade, and again, I did 41 million worth of order flow last year, so I do a lot of trades. I look at a sequence or I build a position. Always think about your trades in terms of a series or a sequence of trades. Uh, you should not be looking at all or nothing trades. It always helps to have a sequence. Uh, so instead of just doing one off trades and, you know, let's say you want to build a position of maybe 300 shares. That's a typical kind of a small but conservative but number. Uh, I will never or seldom do I buy 300 shares or 400 shares or 500 out of the gate for a swing trade. I may just do, you know, an odd lot like 50 or 100 shares and then build if it keeps going up in my favor. And the, the neat thing about that approach, uh, like my colleague Tom Sosnoff, who's brilliant, says trade small, trade often. Uh, that's very important. And let's see. One thing that I would encourage you guys to do is think about breaking your trades into pieces or into sequences. Let's see. Let me see if I can find. Trying to email Anka. I know she knows it's today. Something may come up. There might be a technical issue. That, that certainly happened to me before. So I certainly apologize if any of our speakers aren't able to join us today. But we'll do the best we can. We do have speakers coming up later today. Anyway, so a two-day high-low method works, uh, or it's, it's one of my favorite strategies. Now, one thing I want to take a look at, here's a good example, GNW. I think it's Genworth Financial, going from 4.5 to 5.5. This one took a long time, and the leverage, although the pattern looks good, the range is not good enough to trade. And that's one thing. It's kind of a trade-off, you know, over three months. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to wait three months to get one point. So even it's a very very valuable lesson learned the range is the first thing that you should use to qualify whether or not something's worth trading uh, the bigger the range the more consistent the pattern the better uh, if you have a consistent pattern like this this is a really nice breakout pattern but the range is no good it's not really worth trading because you're not gonna your risk reward isn't there the reward side of that equation isn't there uh, you're not going to risk much likely either but the reward's too small Now here's a good example of a chart that does have reasonably wide range. Now this would not be for newer traders, but it has a really good range going from 18 to 36. So it doubled in less than a month. And this is AEHR, AEHR the ticker. And you can see this thing, not only did it break this after the move down and gapped up on high volume, it broke resistance here, kind of chopped around and finally at a signal day. It's another pattern that I, I teach uh, my traders in my live room. We have signal days. That's we have a wide range candle day. Now, often after the wide day, you have a uh, not as wide day on the second day, uh, but that's often a signal that takes price action above previous consolidation. So what you're looking for is a breakout trigger above previous highs. Well, oh, thanks, Tim. Yeah. Yeah. And again, for those of you just logging in, I apologize. I don't see Anka here. Uh, she was scheduled. Uh, I. I don't know why, why what happened. Uh, I have no idea, but I apologize if any of our speakers aren't able to make it. I know from personal experience, I, I have often had technical issues with my own computer setup, so oftentimes that's it. And if a speaker can't make it to this event, I'll invite them to speak at an upcoming event, so they're always welcome to come back in. Um, anyway, so I apologize in advance if any of our speakers aren't here. Anyway, AEHR. Now this one, I like that the range is big, but this one has a little wide range. It's kind of risky. So it, we, the countermeasure for that, or the thing that I do if there's a wide range, is trade smaller share size. What I like is kind of a middle range. So I don't like, so I'm trying to give you two examples of extremes. Now this one has a, this one has a consistent chart pattern, but the range is too small, okay? This one has a big range, but the chart pattern is good, but it's a little on the risky side, a little high beta, high volatility for my taste. I like charts like this one. 
that I have both the best of both worlds. Am I teaching you guys correctly? Do you guys understand what I'm trying to communicate here? Uh, there's a trade-off between you always want wide range, but not at the expense of if it's all over the place, it's too risky. You don't want narrow range because there's not enough money to be made likely in that chart. So uh, what you want is the best of both worlds is consistent, nice tight range, uh, steady 45 degree angle up trending chart over several weeks, several months, plus a wide range. That's a good combination, the best of both worlds. And it took me over 20 years to learn that. So I hope that that's of service to you. Does that make sense? That's that's the kind of chart you want. Wide range and consistent chart. That's another good example of that kind of chart. Compare and contrast that. Am I, I, hope, I found over the years, it's hard for me to get this point across for people to understand it. Some people get it right off the bat and they're saying, well, yeah, can I get it? Why are you hammering on about it? And other people, well, I'm not really sure what you mean. So we got people of all different experience levels, but I hope that, am I being kind of clear? Uh, you've got the best of both a wide range, at least, for example, to let's quantify. Best to have a two, a two to one ratio on a three month chart. So a 90 day chart that goes from seven to 14, something that doubles on a, so yeah, that's a good rule of thumb. Something at least 150%, but preferably a double on a 90 day chart. So the number at the bottom, the number at the top should be at least twice that, or at least one and a half times that. So if it's seven down at the bottom of 90 day chart, the top, it should be 14. That's easy to remember, right? That's a rider downer. As my colleague, the great, Dan Kennedy would say that's a rider downer, uh, something that has a re reasonably good range. So, uh, so anyway, that's that's a good example of a pattern. We have a wide range, so the range is two to one or so, and the pattern is reasonably moving up. Now, if you look at the you know, for example, this G and W chart. So my point in telling you guys this is chart patterns alone are not enough. That's really important that you get that. Nobody that writes chart pattern books tells people that, but the math behind the chart, the math and the number and the risk reward number is more important than the chart pattern itself, or at least as important. So for example, this one, does it go from four and a half to nine? No, it goes from four and a half to only five and a half. So good looking chart, but not much money to be made. This one, the math doubles from 17 to 34, but the problem is it's not a, pattern. Oh, wow. Okay, I just heard from Manka. She said, total blackout where she is. I've had that happen too. I remember, especially in Hawaii. She said, no internet, no power. So sorry, just happened at 1130. Apologize. Hope you have a great event. Maybe, maybe next time. So yeah, that's from Anka. I'm sorry. She's, she's telling me she's got a power outage. And I believe her. I've had that happen here in Colorado multiple times, and it's uh, certainly so. On behalf of both of us, uh, we apologize. Uh, but it's always something, right? Like I was talking with Dan. Uh, let me show you for proof. I mean, you can. <laughs> I just got this a minute ago. I can total blackout. So sorry, it just happened, etc. So anyway. I, I certainly understand. I've I've had all kinds of technology issues in my life, and you know we, we gotta like I, I talk with the family member a lot about this too. You gotta love technology; it's great, but sometimes it it craps out. You know, like uh, the dang cell phones or the internet or the power. It's it's always something, especially during winter months. I don't know where she lives, but here in Colorado, we frequently have power outages. So on behalf of Anka, I apologize, but she had power outage, so not her fault. She can't do anything about it. I've been there, done that. So. I will definitely invite her to speak uh, at an upcoming event. So anyway, oh well, thanks. Oh well, thanks, yeah, Jill. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Gala. Oh, she's in Boca. Okay. Yeah, it's a. Uh, the trader is saying they wonder about battery backup, but. Uh, no, you can't, you'd have to have a generator to run the house and those are really expensive and dangerous. So um, if there's a power outage, frequently that happens in stormy places like uh, Florida uh, or here in the world. So anyway, enough of that, let's go. Anyway, back to learning point. So this one, it matches on the, it's got the range, 
but it doesn't have a nice consent. It's, it's okay to trade. This one's not a bad chart. This is a decent chart, but I prefer the ones like those earlier ones, the VIPS and uh, CBay and uh, the others that are nice consistent charts over the duration of the three months plus a big range, okay? So anyway, enough of that. P-A-R-R. -R. And let's see, I remember the other, unfortunately the other speaker uh, had to reschedule, but everyone else is on board, so stick around. I'll be here for you guys for the next 30 minutes, and then that, that'll be it. Then Dan, Dan Passarelli will be here at one, uh, and then Norm Hallett, Norm's a good guy, he'll be here at 1.30, then Bennett will be here at two to 2.30, then Marine will be here at 2.30 to three, so. I'm covering for our second speaker too. A lot of these people I've never worked with before, so uh, I don't know, you know, sometimes they can make it, sometimes not, but unfortunately our first two speakers are not in, but everyone else, uh, as far as I know, will, will be here. So I'll I'll stay on a few guys for the next 30 minutes, and then we'll have uh, Dan Passarelli. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dan. He's a smart guy. Uh, finding high probability trades and methodology to boost your win rate. Then Norm Hallett's up at 1.30, and Norm's a good guy too, a trader coach. And Bennett, he's great. Multi time frame analysis. I remember he's covering that in, uh, in Waves uh, and a Marina as well later. So we've got some good speakers coming up. But you have to put up with me for the first 60 minutes. I could play saxophone for fun if anyone wants to hear some tenor horn. But anyway, let's take a look at these charts. Um, well, we'll do day trading coming up right now after these last two. PAR. Hey, before we do, uh, do any of you guys have any swing trading charts you'd like me to pull up? And I will do that. Okay, let's see. Gallo, sure thing. Salesforce. Definitely would be in my portfolio if I were a portfolio investor. We'll look at the chart. Hit me up with your best chart tickers. Everybody give me one or two tickers you'd like me to pull up. And again, I'll be here until the hour, so you got me for another half hour, and then we've got all of our other speakers are resuming at the one o'clock. So apologize. We had a couple of glitches with the speakers today, but it's oftentimes it's, it's not their fault. Like, uh, I think I had a power outage, and I've had that happen here in Colorado multiple times, so I know that works. Let's see, and you. Let's take a look at some of the Trader Choice tickers here. So given what I just said, why would this be a horrible chart? Does it fail the range test? Yes. Does it fail the, the chart pattern going up test? Yes. Is this an epic cluster fudge that would not be a good thing to trade? Yes, this is a horrible chart. Johnny, tell them what they won. You won an all expense paid trade to lose your land. PBR, horrible chart. Okay, CGNX. Hmm. Does that pass the range test? No way, there's not enough range. I'm not gonna play anything at 50 bucks a share. It's only got a, an eight or 10 point range on a three month chart. I'm paying way too much for that chart. I, and, and does it even pass the, the trend test? No, it doesn't have either of those. Okay, so remember guys, ask about charts that look like charts that actually real traders that can make money trading them would trade like this. Like that. Boom. Those are in the money charts. Cha-ching. Charts that chop around that are narrow. Uh, so remember those two tests. It should have minimum one and a half times like 10 on the bottom and 15 on the top, but better be 10 on the bottom and 20 on the top on a 90 day chart. And it should have a pretty good consistent uptrend. I mean, no wonder you guys are losing if you're losing, if you're trading those kind of choppy charts because you just lose money to the market. So make it easy on yourself. Salesforce, I like the swoop up, but the range is no good and it's not very consistent, so nope. I like that it's going up. Uh, this one, no, this is bouncing off a low with, and it's already bounced half of the range, so nope, that's a perfectly terrible chart too. Okay, now let's take a look at some intraday charts. We will flip over to those. Tesla's been good for day traders the last couple of days, right? But look at this one. Here's Coinbase. This is one of our Bitcoin picks that I've covered tra for traders for a very long time. This one, a marathon and riot are the top three. But anyway, I like coin. 
No, my alert for my traders, I told them to go long at the 56.7. Okay, so we got kind of late to the party that was above the previous day's high. It didn't get on my radar until it already run up to just under 56. And I said, nah, we don't want to buy right under the high, but if it breaks over that previous day's high, we go long at 56.7. Now, what you're seeing here is the two-day, two-day, one-minute candlestick chart. Thursday on the left and Friday on the right. You can see the dates at the bottom. I always use a two-day chart because I want to see the OHLC from the open high low close from the prior day plus the range and where key support and resistance is going to be and how to trade it. So before it got there, I told my traders we'd go along at 56.7. That's how I communicate alerts in my live room. I'm like a, a living squawk box, right? And uh, very good at it too. I've been doing it 20 years full time. Thousands of traders trained uh, and I've traded millions of dollars worth of order flow, uh, real money. Uh, what we look for are the best of the breakouts we don't like low float under $10 cheap pop and drop stocks that amateur college kids who don't know how to trade, but pretend they do uh, and get busted by the Federal Trade Commission trade. We don't touch junk stocks like that. We like charts. I like ones actually cheaper than this. I like ones that are like $15, $20 share, but this one was a really good play yesterday, as was Tesla. Tesla's been good for a few days, eh? Shwang, shwoo. And away it goes from 154 up to the 180. 180 was our target yesterday, and mission accomplished. Boom. <laughs> I've been calling along from, I think it's like 163 and change uh, back in the pre-market uh, for Tesla because the gap up and our uh, in-market, yeah, 163.40. When it was down here and starting to bounce, I said, let's go long if it breaks. And at that time, it was right above that little high right there. So 163.4, that's where I told traders to go long in this thing yesterday. How much money could you have made had you taken my alert? And all of you are members, I, I see quite a few of you here. You're welcome. Wait, that was one of our big winners of the week. That was my call on Tesla 163. And the neat thing is, in my live room, we have a lot of really smart people like uh, Mick and, uh, and Damon and so many others, uh, smart people that uh, they give good tickers, uh, bring them to our attention as well. So good to have the teamwork. Anyway, that's a good example of a good day traders chart. Some other wild charts. El Cid. Now, this illustrates an example of a multiple halted uh, mean reversion pullback type chart. A really good run, right? Now, this thing ran from 10 to 17 in the matter of just an hour or so, right? You can see the time frame there from around lunchtime to 1.30, uh, well, right before 2. So about an hour and 15 minutes. This punk ran all the way from 10 up to just under 18. And one could have potentially made a lot of money had one traded that. But if one had held it up at 17 when it got halted, one could have lost a lot of money on the unhalt down to 15 and the second unhalt down to 13. So these kind of charts are a little risky for my taste, but we still cover them. Someone, one of my traders had asked about it. And so I, I gave uh, folks alerts for that one. So BZFD, I think was the most active yesterday. Don't did a slow grind up, but not really much range to it. BYND, Beyond Meats was a pretty good runner. This is the kind of chart that I like for day trading because it's priced in the teens. It trades, uh, by the way, when you day trade, make sure this is very critically important. I've tested this for over two decades. I'm an expert. I am daytradinguniversity.com. Make sure that whatever you trade has at least, trades at least 15,000 shares per minute of volume. And that way you get away from the pump and dump front running chat room, uh, illegal bad guys who buy these cheap ass stocks. Uh, that are thinly traded. It's an old boiler room scheme. And then they say, by now, it's going to go to the moon. I'm going to get in just a minute. And they've already, unknown to their, their victims, they've already bought thousands of shares. And then they post an alert on something that's thinly traded, low float, under $10 POS stock. That's how people blow up their accounts all the time. And thankfully, the FTC and SEC are on top of those kind of things. From Just from me to you, I, I will tell you just good uh, from one friend to another is uh, just don't trade anything that's thinly traded because that's subject to being manipulated by these chat room yahoos and operators who are uh, uh, very dishonest and, and very deceitful. So they're very misleading to use that the FTC's term. So what you don't want is cheap stocks that are thinly traded. If you do trade something that's on the inexpensive side, it should be at least $10 a share. And like this, that has really good volume. You can see the volume bars on this are, you know, anywhere from maybe 15, 20 up to 80, 100,000 shares, but mostly around 20-ish, it looks like. Anyway, reasonably good volume, and the volatility was spectacular. This thing did a run from 16 and change up to 20. 
So a $4 run on a teen price stock, if you just trade a few hundred shares, you can make some money, right? So that's a good play. Other momentum runners yesterday, we had a Peloton did a good run from 12 to 13. This illustrates yet another example of a strategy that I teach. And again, we're, our upcoming new speakers are coming up, but Dan will be here at one o'clock in just around 20 minutes. And then we'll have Norm Hallett and Ben McDowell and, uh, and others, so, and Marina. So we've got new speakers coming up in around 20 minutes. Anyway, one thing I want you to, to be careful to pay attention to in these charts is the uh, whole number strategy. I'm, uh, they call me the whole number guy for a reason. I may have seen my Stocks and Commodities our magazine article uh, and seen some of my many thousands of trades where I illustrate how to go in to buy something right above a whole number and then sell it at like the 0.9 right under the nearest whole number. So this is a good example of a one point range between 12 and 13. So that's kind of the, the majority of the run is to go long and say 1210, 1220, 1230, then sell it to 1280, 1290, right near the whole number. That's a very valuable technique, especially for uh, stocks in the 10 to 20 to as high as maybe $30 sharing. So 10 to $30 share range instruments are really good to trade within their whole numbers because that's a reasonably large percentage of the daily trading range on them. And it's also, also provides good both technical and kind of mental support and resistance. So traders know to look for that. And often that becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because I used to speak on that at Money Show all the time and I published articles and did live seminars and live training in the room and all that for decades using the whole number strategy. And this is a really fine example of how that works. Is everyone clear on that? And by the way, for day trades, you should have stop losses of no more than maybe 20, 30 cents on stocks under 20, 30 dollars a share. Uh, and often I use stops at like five and 10 cents, relatively quick. And if I'm trading large size, I may use like three to five cent stops. So I play it tight depending on how many shares I'm in and the spread and the price action of the individual stock or ETF. Does everyone get that, the whole number strategy? You buy right above the whole number, put initial hard, so let's say you'd buy 12.10 and put a hard stop at say 11.90, right under the whole number. Exit target, you have in the back of your mind, is up near the 13. Now you don't always get the whole number out of it, of course. Maybe it goes up 12 and a half installs and pulls back. Uh, you go ahead and sell it at a 10 or 20 cent pullback. But uh, that's a, a good strategy, I believe, is to look at the whole numbers and trade within them, okay? Intel is good for a bounce for us. I think my long call had been 27.8 and it went up a little bit, but not a whole lot. We call that kind of a scratch trade. I mean, that was a long call and yeah, it went up like 30, 40 cents, but nothing to write home about. Not as big as uh, some of the other charts, but it's still nonetheless a pretty good uh, pattern. Another one that did really good yesterday was the TQs, right? On the market run up, ran from 22 and a half up to 23, uh, almost 24, 23 and a half, 23, eight. So, that's a, this is a good example of a two-day high breakout pattern. So do remember, uh, on your own charts, try and test uh, if you can have two-day charts. And if your charting software doesn't let you do fixed two-day charts like this, kind of a workaround is you can hopefully put together a like a one-day chart of the previous day on the left side and the current day on the right side of two different charts, but they line up because they're the same instrument. So it's yesterday's chart and today's chart. So you can see it's really critically important if you're day trading uh, that you see price elasticity, the trading ranges, how far they're likely to run, and the rest of it. All right, thanks. I'll take a look. I'll take a look at Ford. Is Ford back over 15? Let's see. I don't see it offhand. Yeah, Ford's on the radar because the strength of the lightning, uh, a good play at some point in time, and probably now is as good a time as any. The, the two best ways to go long the market, in my humble opinion, uh, for uh, for intraday is often the TQs and the SOXL, and for inverses, we've got things like the SQs. And one thing that I teach traders a lot in the live room is how to look for uh, patterns that are commonly found in the, the spiders, the SPY. The most common pattern is what? Who can tell me? The most consistent pattern in the stock market is the 10 o'clock reversal. At 10 o'clock, the market almost always pivots. Go back over any number of days to find out. 
here for example now it often doesn't occur exactly at 10 it might be two or three minutes after like yesterday but you almost always get a pivot this is very valuable information and because it's true and it's very consistent test it for yourself uh, test it out remember that ken calhoun told you about the 10 o'clock reversal and see how often it works for you and you'll be impressed i'm if you like any of my thousands of other traders here's another good example so those lines are drawn at exactly 10 o'clock and you get a 10 o'clock reversal a reversal off the current trend whatever direction that is in the spy the spiders s p etf so if it had been going down in price I, it almost always like I don't know the number, but do a back test or somebody do a back test and you'll you'll I'm sure you'll get at least 80 90 percent correlation uh, between say 955 and 1005 you know 10 o'clock give or take a few minutes is almost always a pivot of the prevailing trend and this is a good example of one of each on Thursday the market had been going down at 10 o'clock it spiked right back up again and yesterday the market had been going up and then at 10 o'clock it spiked right back down and sold all the way down to support. And I told traders it'd likely cycle back up there because we're at support near the 404. From there, sure enough, it ran back up to test previous resistance, put in a new high, fade back a little bit, still a long pattern. So that 10 o'clock reversal is a very common pattern that I urge all of you to memorize and learn because it's one that can serve you well. What that means to you as a trader is, for example, if you're thinking about going long in a stock for an intraday or a swing trade, this is very valuable because it's honest. It's the, the truth of the situation. Uh, don't buy right before 10 o'clock if the market's go, going up. You don't buy into the prevailing trend between, say, 9.55, especially. I mean, 9.50, maybe 9.55 and 10. So if the market's going up right before 10, that's a really stupid time to buy. Wait instead until like 10 minutes after 10 and see where you're at. And very, very common, you'll see the market's going down. And sure enough, you dodged a bullet. It didn't get stopped out because you knew about the 10 o'clock rule. Now that's just one example of many patterns that's very consistent that traders don't know about, that professionals like I do know about, that I teach you in my live room at Trade Mastery. All right, so those are the types of insights that I like to share. They're honest, they're based on real facts and data. Uh, I used to be a corporate statistician for the Ford Motor Company after graduating with two degrees, uh, one from UCLA and one from Cal State Long Beach. I've got a master's. Anyway, so I've got a lot of quantitative background, plus all the many tens of millions of dollars worth of stocks and ETFs I've traded. I'm always looking for the difference. There is no holy grail. The only holy grail in trading is small stops when you budge up, right? Uh, that's it. But uh, the main thing is the difference between charts and strategies that work. And things like this timing strategy, that's not based on a chart pattern, is it? It's not. It's based on a time of day effect of the market. You guys probably already know that the markets often pivot near lunchtime sometimes, and that's often true. But this is much more, much significantly, strategically more valuable because it happens virtually every single day. It's a 10 o'clock reversal pattern. And I teach you guys how to trade that live in the markets with live real-time trade examples and specific alerts, uh, both for the open range breakout, say from 930 up until right before 10. That's a, a big focus of the room is ORB's open range breakout. That's, I'd say that's the biggest focus is the gaps, minor gaps, small gaps that keep going up. That's my number one pattern. 45 degree angle breakout prior day, 45 degree angle pre-market, small gap up and you go long. That's the single best breakout pattern in the market. Uh, and 45 degree angle breakouts are great too. So um, anyway, that and the 10 o'clock pivots is good. And then the don't trade after 1030 unless you got a really good reason. Oh, that's good to hear. Kent's telling me the S&P pit traders used to take a break after the first half hour. Don't know which was the chicken or the egg, but the pattern persists. That's good to know. Thanks, man. I was wondering where it came from because I had no idea. I just I observed it from my own training experiences, at the 10 o'clock pivot, but I didn't know that was the, that is likely the genesis for it. So thanks. I appreciate that. Sincerely, I appreciate it. Let's see a question from Rick about, did I ever test five minutes? The only time I use multi time frame is... Uh, is to confirm a pivot you know for example i will maybe pull up the actually i like the the 15 minutes a little stronger uh, but you can pull up the 10 or the 15 minute and see if there is a reversal pattern 
and sometimes it is, but often there's like, here's a very clean shooting star after there's one shooting star that got broken, but broken here, but this is the second shooting star that worked, okay? There was no real pivot sign down here. There wasn't one here. There really wasn't one there. So the candles, when you see them, uh, they work very remarkably good, but only the, the challenge is you don't see you don't see candles at every reversal. So that's one you know pattern to, to be aware of. Again, uh, on behalf of uh, my speakers, I wanted to apologize. A couple of them can shut bank out of power outage and another trader has something else come up. Uh, but uh, we will, we're on track for all the rest of our speakers are picking up starting in just around 10 minutes. And planned on speaking for a whole hour, but it's been good stuff. Does all this make sense so far? Are all these, the patterns, uh, another quick rider downer is uh, don't trade anything that's inside the previous day's range if you can help it. Give focus instead of in, in range charts. looking for charts above previous day's high. Same thing like with futures traders. And you may have heard of, I won't mention her name, but one of the famous uh, market uh, wizards, uh, she had said, uh, uh, talking about the difference between in and out charts. And it's very valuable, strategically useful information. Don't trade stuff that's inside ranges, including the previous day's range. Whether you're a futures trader, an equities trader, or an ETF trader, I mostly trade ETFs, but I also trade I'd probably like two thirds ETFs and one third stocks um, because I like the consistency of the ETFs, uh, the leveraged ones. Uh, but uh, avoid, if you go back over your, your last you know 20 stop losses or 30 stop losses, pick a number of stop losses, you'll probably find that the vast majority of them were uh, entered inside the previous day's range on a, on a, on a relatively weak breakout pattern. So just because there's a cut pattern or a little uptrend on a chart that's inside the previous day's high low range does not qualify it for a good trade setup. The reason high frequency trading algorithms and the professional traders don't put on size until anything's outside of the previous day's high low range. That's one thing a floor trader told me years ago. You don't get volume, you don't get, you don't get uh, volatility unless you're outside of the previous day's range. And by the way, friends, that's true of markets as well as individual instruments. So, Let's see, what's a stop loss and how to use it? Well, I always use the one triggers the other conditional orders. So I always have built in stops on 100% of my trades. Maybe not 100%, but a vast majority of the trades. So I use conditional OTO orders. That's so one triggers the other order. So, like, say on Monday, I put an order to say buy, let's say it opens at 62. And uh, I put an order to buy at say 62.70. I'll also put in an order to put a stop loss at say 62.40 or so. So I use a one triggers the other order. So the first order, once it activates, it automatically uh, then activates a trailing stop or a hard stop. It's your choice, of course, uh, on that position. So that way you're. It's a really good way to trade on autopilot. Is one to, that's why I do as many as 111 or so, 112 trades I've done daily. Uh, I've been really aggressive in my trading this year. I'm cutting way back this year, but um, the way that I, I do it is I use one triggers the other orders, and that way it builds the position for you uh, on autopilot. The other thing I do is I put in a ladder or a sequence of trades. I don't just buy the first entry. I put in a sequence uh, spaced reasonably far apart. Now, on this chart, you do something like 50 cents, maybe even a dollar apart before scaling in. On charts that are less expensive, and the ones that I... I personally prefer <coughs> trying to find the one that was like, well, this one, that one's kind of cheap. I was looking for the one that maybe it was BYND. Yeah, a chart like this. You put on a sequence of trades maybe every 40, 50 cents. And that way you put on what, what's called, professional traders are called a ladder. So you got a ladder of trades, you got entries every n cents, like maybe every 50 cents or so, you put on a trade and you scale into it. So that's something to look for. Instead of just throwing, you know, throwing a big bet and hoping for the best, often the first trade you get shaken out. The second trade, maybe break even. Third trade, you get shaken out. And the fourth trade, maybe break even. But the fifth trade makes some money. And then the sixth trade gets shaken out. But the seventh trade makes a really big amount of money. And then the eighth and ninth trade gets shaken out. 
anyway, that, that's kind of the progression as a day trader. So you have kind of a sequence of trades. The the price you pay, you know, for that is that it's 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 work. I mean, you got to put in a sequence of entries, but the payoff can be really good because that way you don't have to get it right all the time. My most profitable years, like my single most biggest money profitable year, and I have had verified profitable years as a trader, of course. I was wrong 74% of the time in terms of the uh, the number of wins versus stops, but I was still very net profitable, very net profitable that year on the remaining 26% because I made more money on the wins than aggregate I lost on the stop losses. So don't worry about it if you're wrong more than half the time. I'm here to tell you for the rest of your life, you will always be wrong at least 50% of the time in your trades. I guarantee it. And anybody who says otherwise is lying to you. Nobody is right like 80% of the time in their trades. No, that's BS. Now, you will be wrong more often than not for the rest of your life as a trader. Deal with it. Get over it. But the way you do that correctly is to be wrong really, really small. You know, if I take five 10 cent stops, a one 60 cent win, I'm a winner, even right only one out of six times. Think about it. I, it's the truth of the matter. That's why guys who are really smart like Sosnov say, trade small, trade often. Any floor trader will tell you the same thing. You're throwing a lot of darts. You take a lot of stops and break evens, maybe small win, small ups, small downs, and flats. That's what we call in the street. Small ups, small downs, and flats in pursuit of the moderate. You won't get a lot of huge mega wins, but it's about, all about the moderate wins, like 30, 40, 50 cent wins on your day trades with stops of like a nickel and a dime. So, you know, if you take, you know, 10, 10 cent stops, but you have like three 40 cent wins, uh, you make money even being right only three out of 13 times. So, does that make sense? All right, thanks. Oh, thanks, Agnes. Good to meet you, too. I know Rick is asking on something like TQs, how do you avoid getting stopped out? I said another strategy that I designed called buy the open, sell the close. And that's one in which you put a buy stop order right above the pre-market high that you maybe get filled in at, say, 9, oh, 9.35 or 9.40. You get filled in the first half hour or so. Uh, and then you let it put a hard stop right under the pre-market low and then let it ride and close it at the end of the day. So what that does for you is a huge improvement over, uh, and that's a good question. Yeah, I'd get stopped out on that one for sure, uh, the TQs. I wasn't trading TQs yesterday, but that one is one, despite its uptrend, if you tried to navigate the ups and downs, good luck, because you probably get shaken out more often, right? I, and I agree with the trader, that's true. But a buy the open, but a buy the open, sell the close strategy is one in which you'd Go long right above the 930 open, say right here, put a hard stop down there, and then walk the F away, walk the heck away until four o'clock arrives, and then sell it right into the close. And so that way you don't have to navigate the ups and downs. So good, that's what I used to call intraday swing trading, but that's kind of too many syllables. So now I just say B O S C, buy the open, sell the close. And that's where you buy the opening on a breakout, put a hard stop right under support. Uh, if you want at lunchtime, you might want to tr tighten the trail stop from what would be a stop loss to a break even. So let's say you buy here, uh, but you can't do that till after 12. Okay, so you buy here with our stop there, and then at lunchtime, you may want to tighten that trail up from here, tighten it up to your break even. So that way, at worst, even if it sells off in the afternoon, you're out at flat or slightly above if you want to set the trigger like that. So does that help, folks? I hope that that gives you some really valuable insights. That's 20 years of lessons learned in intraday and swing trades and uh, I hope that it's all been very clear and easy to understand. I hope there's no confusion. You know, for example, when I say on the 90 day chart, it has to have at least one and a half or two or twice the range, you know, a $10 to $20, uh, 10 to 20 on the right side with a nice clean breakout versus those choppy charts you guys are mentioning. Uh, that should be relatively easy to visually scan for, right? And for these kind of charts, we're looking for two day high breakouts or gap continuations uh, for charts that have good volume good volatility uh, and good good sense in terms of trading uh, success. Let's see where things are going here. A coin's a good example of a breakout to the upside, right? This thing ran all the way from 53 up to 62, uh, and it ran nearly what we call a dime, or nearly 10 points. And I miss this one. I, you know, I, I miss things all the time. Uh, I don't get them all, but at least I alerted my members to it. Uh, and I called along for my members at 56.7. The only reason I didn't take it is it doesn't fit my personal, my personal preference is I like charts that are like 10, 15, 20, $25 share. So I generally don't trade 
things that are over $50 a share as a rule of thumb. But I still cover those for my members who do because they value it. And uh, we all you know, could have done well with that alert yesterday, 56, 7, right? Because it ran all up to 62. So big range. And that's another good example of where buy the open, sell the close strategy would have worked because you know, you might have got shaken out during these little pullbacks if you play a really tight game like I do. But if you just buy smaller shares in the early part of the day and sell it at, you know, at 3.30, 4 o'clock at the end of the day, uh, you don't have to, the, the thing it saves is you don't have to worry about navigating the ups and downs. So anyway, that's going to do me for here. I think uh, we're due for Dan coming up in just a minute. So hopefully Dan was here earlier. So, and there he is. Hey, Mr. Dan. Let me un. Hey, hey Dan. what's up, Ken? How you doing, my friend? Hey, pretty good. I've been talking for an hour, so uh, looking forward to hear what you got to say. Hopefully I can figure out how to make you a co-host. Okay. I'm still trying to figure out how to change presenter control. Now, can you take presenter control if you want? Oh, let's see here. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, it looks like I can. Well, have at it then and go ahead. Uh, hey, everybody, it's Dan Passarelli. Looking forward to hearing what Dan has to say. Yeah, I can see your face. Good to see you, man. Good morning. Yeah, good morning to you, Ken. Uh, I'm looking forward to this here. Let's see. Uh, share my screen. Oh, uh, and we'll do, uh, I guess, this one. We're going to get a little. Yeah. You can there see we go. Desktop. And how do I, let's see, I'll, un, I'll unvideo myself or I'm not in there. Okay, good. I think, I think we are all in good shape. So, hey, Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring. Good to see you, man. It's a, we've known each other at a distance for years and it's good to finally get these shindigs going where we can work together. So pleasure to have you here and uh, thanks uh, everybody give Dan Passarelli a warm welcome and uh, take it away. Thanks for being uh here, man. All right. Thanks. And, and by the way, you can see my main screen, a simple way to increase your win rate. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, okay. All right, so, hey, um, Dan Passarelli here. How are you feeling today? I'm really excited to share with you a simple process I've created to boost your win rates. And at the end of this training, um, I'll follow up and show you how to move forward with it. Before we get started, I need to point out options are not for everyone. You should read characteristics and risks of standardized options before trading, and you can get a copy of that by emailing investor services at the OCC.com. This is my promise to you today. I'm going to share with you a way to trade a high probability trade so you can boost your win rate by up to 53% more than your current win rate by actually seeing the trades professional traders are trading real time without them even knowing, which sounds pretty great, doesn't it? And at the end of this presentation, I'll share how you can take the next step and start getting these results right away. So, uh, hey, tell me, is that a fair deal? Do you like what you're hearing? Uh, if you do, hit that chat box for me and, uh, and let me know, please. You like what you're hearing here. Let me move the chat box here so I can see it. Uh, oh, good morning, Agnes. Uh, Timothy says yes, and John says yes, or at least sure. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Chris says so far, good. I like it. Uh, I like this. Uh, Mario Fana says yes. Daniel says yes. All right, you guys are awesome. Now, be sure to stay till the end of this presentation. Uh, first of all, the most important things I'll share come later. And there's going to be more great speakers today, I think, right? I don't think I'm last here. Um, and to keep the focus, I'm going to hold all the questions till the end. So if you have a question, write it down and I will get to it. So that said, let's keep it positive and let's have some fun, shall we? So once again, I'm Dan Passarelli. I traded down on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange for many years. I wrote two of the most popular books on option trading, worked with every major options broker and exchange in the US and abroad. And I get to be on TV a lot, which is kind of fun. But this here is also uh, who I am and what I do. And these are the important things. The most important thing to me is my family my kids, my wife, Kathleen, and our, you know, our two adult children, Sam and Isabel. One of the things we like to do together is travel. We enjoy new cities, learning about new cultures, nature, food and wine, 
We've been all over the world together. We're a musical family. We enjoy listening to music and playing it as well. And these are things that are important to me and trading helps me be able to do them. But hey, enough about me, let's talk about you. I know some of you are just starting out. Some are already doing pretty well and some have been struggling for a while. Whatever your current success level is, you know you can always do better, right? Maybe that means having a little more freedom to take time off and play golf or actually taking that three to five day vacation to a dream beach home at an Airbnb with friends and family. Maybe being able to give more to your family members, put your kids or grandkids through college. Listen, here at Market Taker, we're never going to preach about how, you know, trading could get you that, uh, <laughs> you know this, Dan, thanks, that brand new Ferrari or anything. But listen, here's what's important today. What if you could learn a life skill? trading that allowed you to to do some of these things you know maybe purchase a much thing convertible to enjoy on a nice summer days or something all of this is possible now let's talk about option trading in option trading time literally is money and the reason is because options provide more ways to make money and one of the most important of which is time decay as time passes, options lose their value. And this helps certain traders who know how to put time decay to use. It helps them. Now, that last bullet point here might seem counterintuitive, that time passing creates money because a lot of traders buy options. But what I like to say is, if you can't beat them, join them. Put time on your side. Instead of buying options and being at a disadvantage, many traders sell them. In fact, selling options is actually more popular than buying them because options lose their value over time. It's a way to make money as time passes. Now, one thing about selling options is if I just sell an option, um, you know, I could end up with a small profit potential but much bigger risk. <clears throat> so we want to be very strategic. There are two limited risk strategies um, that are very strategic option spreads that are at the heart of all option trading, so much that I call them the mother strategies of option trading, and that is time spreads and credit spreads. And today, I want to, sp I want to focus on credit spreads. There are two types of credit spreads. There's call credit spreads and put credit spreads. A call credit spread is when I sell usually an add or out of the money uh, call and buy a higher strike call with the same expiration on the same underlying. Put credit spreads are when I sell a put, usually add or out of the money, and then buy a lower strike put with the same expiration on the same underlying. Now, look, if you're new to options, and if any of these terms are new to you, don't worry. Throughout this presentation and afterwards, we're going to cover everything you need to know to trade these with the skill of a professional trader. Now, an important takeaway is that because there are both call and put credit spreads, this method of trading works in both up and down markets. Now, to be clear, these are not directional trades, not bullish or bearish trades. Basically, with a call credit spread, as long as the stock doesn't rise above a certain point, the short option strike price, the trade can make its maximum profit. So it's not bearish, you know, it's more like not very bullish, right? And with the put credit spread, as long as the stock doesn't fall below the short put option strike, the trade can make its maximum profit. So a put credit spread is more like a not very bearish trade is how I like to think of it. These are what many traders call a line in the sand trade. As long as the stock stays on this side of the line, it wins. So let's go through an example so you can see what I mean and start to understand this. Let's say a trader thinks Citigroup is not likely to rise above resistance at $54 a share. The trader can position him or herself to make money as long as Citigroup doesn't go above 54 bucks a share over the next 10 days by selling the 54 calls that have 10 days to expiration and at the same time buying the 55 calls. So they sell the 54 calls at 49 cents, buy the 55 calls at 28 cents, 
So this can trader collected a net credit of what? 21 cents, right? 21 cents of option premium is $21 of money. So this is a 10 contract trade. So that's actually collecting $210. As long as the stock stays below $54 a share for the, just the next 10 days, this trader can make up to $210 on his 10 lot and do so with limited risk because we're protected by buying the 55 strike call. All right, let's get to the heart of this. This is a probability curve. The horizontal axis down here, this is the stock price and the vertical axis is the probability of the stock being at that price. What we have here is a bell curve. Now, most finance professors who love to get technical and use fancy terms will say that stock prices are log normally distributed. Write that down. So this graphic being a bell curve is not technically exactly correct, but it's a close enough artist rendition, all right? Now to make it simple, here's what this curve shows. The middle is where the stock price currently is. The higher part of the curve here says that smaller moves are more probable than bigger moves, right? You see that? Um, so if we look at the past 30 or whatever closing prices, or if we're forecasting for the future, if here is today's stock price, most recent or future prices would fall here, close to where this today's stock price is. But a small number would have closing prices farther away from where the stock is now. Now, another huge implication that <clears throat> this has is that is that finance professors assume that the stock has about a 50-50 chance of heading higher or lower. This is, there's a slight interest rate component there uh, that gives a small bias to the stock going up, but this is basically how finance professors think about it, 50-50. Now that said, we're gonna talk about how we can change those odds more in your favor throughout this presentation. Now, because in this case, the stock was at $52.61 when the trade was put on and we sold the 54 strike calls, we have a head start in making money. Let's go back to that professor math. If the stock is at $52.61 and there's about a 50-50 chance of it being lower at expiration, that 50% chance of occurren occurrences would be winners. Then for the other 50% of the time, when it goes up, some of that time, the trade would be a winner too. Only if it's trading far enough above the strike price at expiration does the trade lose. And that's why credit spreads are naturally high probability trades. Now, with our trades, we have to look at more than just that, more than just the win rate. We need to talk about several things, including the risk. Every trade is a balance of probability of success versus risk reward. So let's look at that Citigroup trade again. If a trader sold this credit spread and collected $210 and held it all the way until expiration and Citi ended up below 54 at expiration, the options would expire and the $210 would be the final profit as shown by the blue line right here, All right? If the stock rises above $54, the trade might still be a winner. The credit from selling the spread was 21 cents. So the actual break even is $54.21. Below 54.21, the trade wins. Above there is where the trade loses. And we'll talk more about the loss in a second. So first, as you can see here, with the stock at 52.61, again, there's about a 50% chance of the stock going down. And if it does, and it's trading lower at expiration, then that leads to maximum profit. Then there's a 50% chance of it going up. And again, some of that 50% would also lead to maximum profit. 
up until we get to $54 a share. That's where the trade starts getting worse. So your odds of success are naturally overwhelmingly in your favor, but I want to be very clear about something. You stand to lose more than you stand to win. While the maximum win is 21 cents of option premium or $210 of money on this 10 lot, the maximum loss is 79 cents. So we calculate the max loss by taking the difference between the two strike prices. So 55 minus 54 minus the credit. So that's a dollar minus 21 cents is 79 cents. In this case, the risk is more than three times the profit potential. Like I said, there's a balance between probability of success and risk reward. So what we need is an edge above and beyond just the probability of winning. And this is what's different about our approach to trading credit spreads. We get that edge. So the odds are overwhelmingly in your favor above and beyond this simple approach that everyone else uses on credit spreads. What if we could find a bunch of credit spreads that are high probability trades to start out with? Then we take all of them and see which meet certain criteria that would make it an even high probability of winning above and beyond the simple professor math. And then we take only the best probability of risk reward of those. That would be powerful, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Now, before I get into how to see the trades the institutions are making, because I'm going to show you how to do that in a second, let's first look at what this looks like in real life. On August 2nd at 2.05.40 in the afternoon, a big institutional trader sold 850 of the August 22nd, 120, 124 call credit spreads at 45 cents. So that means the trader sold short 850 of the August 22nd, 121 strike calls. And at the same time, as part of one trade, also bought 850 of the August 22nd, 124 calls. That is a call credit spread. Same expiration, two different strikes. Because the 121 calls are a lower call strike, they had more premium. Thus, the trader took in a credit when the trade was made. In this case, it was 45 cents per contract. Now, 45 cents of option premium is $45 of actual money. Times 850 contracts, this is a pretty big trade. Now, after about two and a half weeks, expiration came along, and this trader could have made $38,250 at that time. What if... You were alerted about this trade the second it happened. Well, a small number, a small trader following along and trading just five contracts could have made $225. Now, $225 may not look like a lot compared to $38,250. But imagine doing this many times over and over again. This is what leads to this being a wealth building activity, even and especially for smaller traders. And bigger traders might consider somewhat bigger trades. A 10 lot trader could have made $450. And on a 20 lot, that would be $900. And by the way, Again, if credit spreads or even options in general are new to you and you're not 100% clear yet on everything we're talking about, in just a few minutes, I'm going to share how to make all this really super simple to follow along with. So now let's look at another example. In Apple on August or July 29th at 10.51 and 17 seconds in the morning, 500 of the August 5th, 150, 160 put credit spreads traded at $1.20. So this trader sold 500 of the 160 puts and at the same time also bought the 150 puts. The trader took in a total credit of $120 a contract on this put credit spread. The put credit spreads advantage is that it's a not very bearish trade. As long as the stock is above $160 at expiration, which in this case is just a week later, 
this trader would make a $60,000 profit. Now imagine you see this trade the millisecond it happens. A trader trading just a one lot credit spread could add $120 to his or her account. A trader who typically trades five lots could have made $600. 10 lot traders could have made $1,200 and that would be $2,400 on a 20 lot. Now in Tesla, on September 19th at 11.26 and 16 seconds in the morning, a big trader traded 255 September 23rd, 315, 335 call credit spreads at $3.60. Big trade. Then about 50 seconds later at 11.27 and five seconds, the trader sold another 255 credit spreads at $3.57. Now, again, these are not super time sensitive trades like day trading or anything. The price often doesn't change all that much in you know, in a day, uh, at least a lot of the time. So remember, you make money by time passing, right? That's how these things work. If you miss the first trade here and even miss the second one and happen to notice it an hour later, it's still possible to participate in the trade. Now, if this trader held the trade to expiration, and the stock stayed below $315, at expiration, he or she would have made $182,835. Pretty great day trading, right? And that was in just four days. So even a smaller trader, regular trader, like you know you and me, Trading just a one lot could have added $357 to his or her account. Five lot traders could have made $1,785 in profit. 10 lot traders could have made $3,570. And on a 20 lot, that would have been $7,140. These are just a couple examples so that you get a feel for how this works. I have dozens of examples of how this works that I'll be sharing in even, even greater detail in a boot camp video class. And in just a few minutes, I'll share how you can get access to that video recording of a full half day boot camp that record, we recorded for you already. Now, look, if you're like me, you get a lot of messages and some of them are important. If you didn't open the email or text you got about this training, you could have missed one of the best trading opportunities that I've ever shared, but you get some noise too. What if you could get just the most important messages and skim them over on your lunch hour or break and get all the information you need to make these trades all in one place without the noise? You just see what's important, what I like to call purposeful notifications, like when uh, one of these big traders is making a trade like this. Wouldn't that be great? Well, that is what I'm about to share with you right now. Credit Spread Genius is officially here. Every day you get real-time alerts when traders are trading a large volume of credit spreads to open one of these new positions like you saw. So you will be the first to spot these trades so you can participate in the best trades in the market using my proprietary trade triggers to see exactly when the trade is happening real time. And then follow a simple checklist to proofread it. And it's to make sure that it's a trade worth taking. And it's all extremely simple. I'm sharing this now so you can start getting the results that you deserve. Like this one on October 18th in Nike, a trader could have followed the institutional traders and traded a five lot of the October 91-95 uh, call credit spread and could have made $420 on a five lot holding it until expiration. 
a 10 lot would have made up to $840. In Apple, on September 30th, a tr trader could have traded a five lot of the October 120, 130 put credit spreads at $1.32 and made up to $660 on just a five lot. A 10 lot would, would have been $1,320. In FedEx, let's skip down here on October 7th, a trader could have done the October 160, 175 call credit spreads and made up to 1,200, excuse me, $1,025 on just a five lot. That's $2,050 on a 10 lot. So I want you to meet Chris from Mobile, Alabama. Chris was one of the first people to use credit spread genius. And Chris said, as a busy professional, I like the credit spread alerts because they save me time researching trades. The nature of the credit spreads also means that these alerts are not as time sensitive. I can check the alerts in between patients or at lunch, then quickly formulate a plan to execute the trade. This is my easy to use system uh, that sends instant alerts to you when big institutional traders trade a big credit spread trade. You'll follow the smart money so you never have to second guess yourself in the market again. You get password access to real-time trade triggers sent directly from the Chicago Board Options Exchange. I've pulled some strings for you. I've negotiated a contract with the Chicago Board Options Exchange for you to get professional trade data that you can't get from any other source. I repeat, you literally cannot get this from any other source. I, as a professional in this field, I pay for the data because not only is it expensive, it's about $7,000 a month is what I pay, but it's not available to non-professionals at any price until now. And the best part is, it's all legal. When you sign up, you'll sign up as yourself, a non-professional trader, and get access to these signals through this deal that I made with the exchange on your behalf. This is both powerful and simple. Now, the closest thing to what I'm sharing with you today is what you'd call an alert system. And this is what one person who used Credit Spread Genius had to say about his experience. I've used other alert systems before. Mostly those are alerting naked long calls or puts, mostly way out of money and seem like a lottery ticket. I never gained any ground with those. This credit spread alert system seems different somehow, like it tells more of what the big dogs are thinking. So I've created a true high probability trading system with real edge that doesn't require constant attention along with the training so that you can screen, set up, and manage the trades. This is something that actually works. I've talked with my friends at the CBOE about how to get this, idea, this data. They built an algorithm that scans the market every millisecond for trades the smart money is making and then pushes them out to our traders in a password-protected browser. No one else has this technology. You can't get it from your brokerage uh, account. You can't get it from anywhere. But the other important thing is the education that comes along with it so that when you see these trades happen, you screen them by going through our simple checklist to see if you should take the trade or not. So let's talk about the credit spread genius alerts. Here's what you're gonna get today when you enroll and start getting these alerts. First, you're gonna get the credit spread genius trade triggers. They're gonna pop up in a, in a password protected browser window and you'll see the big credit spreads being traded by the institutions. That For an entire quarter, you're gonna get access to this. That's a $3,000 value. And then I wanna get you up and running fast. So you're going to get the Credit Spread Genius Accelerator video course. You'll watch that and be able to hit the ground running. That is a $1,000 valued course. You'll also get the Credit Spread Genius Bootcamp video. So you will truly have this mastered. You will also get the MTM Spreadsheet Trade Tracker. This is my personal spreadsheet that I use to track all of my trades to make sure that I'm not missing a single step in the checklist, so I'm making only the best trades. That is a $500 value. You will also get access to the MTM Community Chat Room, because for you to succeed, 
I need to put you in a community of traders who have gone through the struggles that you're going through and many who had made it through the other side and become successful. And then finally, an extra bonus, we're going to give you a 30 minute strategy call with our trader success team to, so that you can get over what's holding you back and finally reach your trading goals. This is a total value of $8,977, but even a million mile journey begins with the first step. And this is that first step. Go right now to markettaker.com slash WTT and get all this for a small, easy investment of just $497. Now, a logical question is what happens after the first quarter? Hello. Don't believe in that for me. So after the first quarter, when you join today, you will be able to renew at just $497 a quarter for life. Now, when I say for life, you're not locked into anything. There's no long-term contracts. Join now and, you know, if it turns out you make five or six or $7,000 from trading these credit spreads by following the smart money, you'll want to stick with the program. And this has the potential of saving you thousands and thousands of dollars over your lifetime. So go to markettaker.com slash WTT right now and get started right away. Now, I think I've got about zero seconds left to take questions. Uh, right. So <laughs> I'm going to pass the pass the baton. Hey, well, thanks so much, Dan Passarelli. Excellent presentation too, is a smart one. Uh, so I will, you're definitely invited back for another, you know, later in the year, if you want to come back to another one of these, but sounds like a good deal to me and it's a really intelligent. So uh, uh, very well uh, spoken too. So thanks so much, hey, it's Dan, a good presentation. Dan, hey, Dan, hi, Ken. Dan, this is Norman. I, I just, uh, somehow I can't get my video off, but I wanted to, I, I want to use the first minute of my section just to say hi to you, Dan. It's, I haven't seen you in person probably four or five years. Yeah. Uh, I, and I also want to say, you may not know this, but I ran one of the largest option firms in the country back in the back in the eighties. I didn't um, know that. I just I just saw I just saw your entire presentation here, and um, and I, I just want to say to everybody out there that the, the 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 option professionals that really make the money are not the people that try all different kinds of processes. You've picked, and, and this is from my my background, you've picked one of the best and most consistent ways of invest and one of the most, nothing simple about options, but it's one of the, one of the most simple things to understand. And, um, and so if you're out there thinking any kind of confusion in this, I think you've really narrowed it down in this. So I, I want to congratulate you from a guy that was in charge of, of 60 traders trying to make the best of it in options and saying, you're the kind of guy and, and uh, that, that, that really knows, you know, how to do this. So I really, I enjoyed your presentation. So well, Norm, thank you so much. And it's so great to hear from you, man. Um, oh yeah. You know what? Uh, if you guys move forward with credit spread genius, I'll tell you what, listen, listen to Norm's uh, presentation. I've, I've heard him speak many, many times and he is, uh, he is just the master. It's at not, my stuff is not a conflict. And Ken is like, the, he's the, he's the great, uh, he's the great com combiner, you know? <laughs> so I appreciate you getting us all together, Ken. Well, thanks. So you guys are both top of the notch. That's why you're here. So I appreciate it. You guys are both outstanding. I really, I was impressed, Dan. And like to Norm's point, it's like here in the West, we say, beware of the man that only has one gun. And it's a smart way when it comes to learning something complicated like options, one play that's well done is very valuable because you don't have to learn the whole kit and caboodle. And, and a Norm's outstanding too. I've known Norm for I don't know, 10, 15 years, a long time. Norm's one of the best guys out there to yeah, help traders. So oh, you guys no. are you guys are both great. So traders, you guys should buy all their stuff. They're, they're, these guys are good. They're, they're, or else they wouldn't be here. So I highly recommend both both men. So thanks. Good Norm. seeing you, Dan. Good seeing you, Norm. Bye. Well, hey, Norm, now you can share your screen, hopefully. Okay, let's see. Uh, that, that looks pretty good. Let's do the share thing here. And boy, so good seeing Dan. Yeah, yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, I've never worked with him before. I have known you for a long time. I haven't, I haven't worked with Dan yet. So, let me, and I didn't know about your background with options too, Norm. So that's just, 
Yeah, yeah I, I don't tell many people because uh, it was so long ago and it makes me look old, old back in the 80s. So, you know, I, no, we're, we're I don't all used to how many years of uh, service I've had. Now I just put two or three decades. That's why people have to do the math. No, but you, know, you know, Norm, that's a big plus because you know who's out there getting people's attention is these 20-something-year-old kids on YouTube claiming to make $100,000 a day. And that's foolish. We, we need The traders need to learn from people like you and Dan and myself who've been around a few decades and we know what we're talking about. So... Uh, yeah, traders, uh, I, uh, traders, we're honored to have Norm Hallett here from the Discipline Trader. I've known Norm for a long time. He and Tish are a great team to help traders with their coaching and other programs. Uh, uh, the total value, what Norm offers should be priced at two or three times what he asked for. Uh, so uh, Norm Hallett from the Discipline Trader, welcome aboard and good to have you here. Thanks man. again, Ken. It's so, so great to see you. Uh, you know, with COVID, I, you don't get out much. It's, I thank God for Zoom. Anyway, th well, thanks and welcome everybody to, to my uh, 25 to 30 minute presentation. I just want to um, give you a, an idea of what it's like to, um, uh, to pass, to ha actually use somebody else's money uh, and, and get 90% of the profit. I mean, not, not, there's not a lot of, uh, not a lot, but it's, it, it always surprised me how many teachers out there, how many um, gurus out there don't actually trade. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, some, some great traders are lousy teachers, uh, some, some uh, so, you know, so it, it works both ways. But I think that mostly traders can be, are comfortable with knowing that you've done what you've asked others to do. And I wanted to just show you these. Uh, the, I've passed both of the testing in Top Step and Apex. Uh, I left Top Step and went to Apex because that's where most of the uh, traders that are on my list were asking me about Apex. If you don't know what um, what prop trading is, uh, I mean, it's just simply where a, 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 a firm, usually, usually a hedge fund of some sort, but uh, they're firms that have equity and they allow you to trade that money and they'll give you 90% of the profit. Well, how can that be? Um, well, they, they charge you fees on a monthly basis while you're passing their, their testing. You have to pass testing. Once you pass the testing, then you get funded. And those, uh, they know that 90% of traders will not pass. And uh, for the same reason that 90% of traders don't make money. And the reason, most of that reason, I believe, is not so much the trading plan, but the mental, emotional capabilities to follow the plan. And, um, you know, that's been my shtick for, for now the last 15, 20 years, I've been focusing on the mental and emotional. And it occurred to me that, you know, that this sounded too good to be true. The fact that you could uh, trade somebody else's money and it'll give you the vast, in fact, Apex will give you the first 25,000 that you make in an account. They'll give you the 100% of that and they'll, they'll allow you to, uh, and, and then 90, only 90% of the profit after that. But they do that in order to entice the majority of traders that 90 percent to just keep paying them fees because they're this they see the carrot but uh they don't uh, don't, don't really have a process to do that i'm going to show you the process that i used to uh to gain uh, to to pass and get funded okay um so again i wanted to welcome you ask your prop trading I'm going to give you a free download of my um, of a white paper that I wrote on the topic. So I want to whet your appetite here, and then then we'll go for it after that. Okay, you can go for my booklet. Uh, my background, you see how, how to design, and I've written several books on uh, building trading plans responsibly, and um, that really helped me to adjust my trading plan, that my usual trading plan, in order to fit the the stringent rules that are given to you in order to pass these evaluations, okay? Uh, and these are other things that exist on, I think this is the only book now, I've wrote, written several of them on, on trading plans that still exist on um, on Amazon as well as these. Um, in fact, I think, I think Dan was there when I made this presentation. This is actually a video that was produced by uh, uh, the Expo people uh, and somehow they made a product uh, and they sell it. That's not even my product. And anyway, I worked for Payne Weber for a while, uh, just to give you a big name that I worked for is really the only large corporation besides International Trading Group, the large option firm I talked about. But Payne Weber was um, spent a couple of years with them as a commodity specialist. But believe it or not, I didn't like it because it was too much of a sales job. You know, they want to just sell stuff. Yeah, you know, I, 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 as you're going to see from this presentation, I'm not a, a terrific salesperson. The Hallett Group is something, so I left Payne Weber and I started my own um, commodity trading advisory where I was managing um, 
$250,000 accounts more for qualified uh, investors. And I was making 20% of the profit, not 90%, but 20%. I was very happy with that, clear through my own IB. The problem is it's very stressful. If you think that the trading with your own money is stressful, try trading, if you're a responsible person, <laughs> try trading somebody else's money. I think you'll, you'll see a big, uh, big difference in, in uh, emotional involvement. But the last 10, 15 years or so, I've been concentrating on what I believe is the missing piece in trading, and that's the mental and emotional capabilities. So in a lot of my offers, when I talk about the actual trading, I always include something that involves fixing uh, your fear of losing or your, um, or your lack of patience or whatever. I always try to include that because it doesn't matter how good a trading plan is or how many signals you get from services doesn't really matter if you can't take action and do the right thing at the right time with no with little or no emotion uh you're not going to get very far as a trader and that's what the 90 percent uh having an issue with so let's let's get into some of the tips uh the, the first my promise i'm going to lay out the pros and cons of prop trading by the end of the presentation you're going to have somewhat a clear idea of whether prop trading is for you, okay? It almost sounds too good to be true. Whenever somebody complains to me about one of the rules in prop trading, like one of the rules is that you can't hold the position overnight. So at five o'clock, you have to be out of the position. Uh, all of the rules that prop trading firms give you in order to pass and then continue to trade their money uh, are meant to keep you more and more conservative. If you don't hold the trade overnight, it means that you won't be, um, you, you won't be exposed to some crazy piece of news that happens uh, when the markets are not trading, which in futures is primarily only an hour a day from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. But still, um, if you break that rule, if you hold a position for some reason uh, through uh, through the day, you will that'll, that'll bust out your account. You're going to start your your testing again from the beginning. Uh, so there are very strict rules, but if you if you can be a disciplined trader, you can do this. I did it. You can do this. Okay. I'm going to just leave. I'm going to. I'm going to leave this chart up in, in silence for the next minute. I just want to show you that here is testing for a $50,000 account. This is the one that I chose to try to pass. I also have a $150,000 account I'm working on. I'm going to show you a little bit about that and a two fifty. And the reason is because I, 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 there's several reasons, but I want to show you this screen. Uh, you've got to make $3,000. You can, you can trade as many as 10 contracts. You've got to make three thousand dollars before you lose twenty five hundred, and there are no, there are really no other rules uh, that are predominant here. And in order, while you test, you've got to pay them one hundred and sixty seven dollars a month. So if you like the look of this, you would pay them, you would start paying one hundred and sixty seven dollars a month. And as you're trying to pass it, if you pass thirty days, you're going to pay them another one hundred and sixty seven dollars. And if you blow out the account, if you pass the twenty five hundred, um, then uh, if you breach the 2500 uh you you have to uh you, you can stay in the game if you want to stay in the game you've got to re up again you've got to refresh your account that's $80 so $80 you start from zero and let's say you were down 1500 in your account and you only had 1000 left maybe it's better to reset your account then start from zero and start to test again so i'm going to leave this screen up just for about 60 seconds and let you look at the different um, categories that you could be testing for. Okay, a couple of things that I'll show you here uh, real fast. That was a quick 60 seconds, I know, but since this presentation is half what I usually present, I made the 60 seconds only 30 seconds. I think you can... Uh, <laughs> I think you can forgive me for that. But let's check, check this out. They say you can, I don't know if anybody that's going to trade 10 full contracts, unless you have some sort of a scalping system and you want one or two ticks uh, on a $50,000 account. They count each of the contract. If you trade micros, it's only counted as a one tenth contract. That's what this means. Um, all right. I like the 150 another account because look at this. You have, uh, you have a, a profit goal that's not quite twice what the what the trailing threshold is here it's one to one so this is a little bit better you've got a little bit more give here so i, I and the, the difference in money wasn't the same incidentally if if you get really excited about this and you go to apex i've got some discount codes for you right now uh, people signing up i have a discount code if you just email me and and on the download i'm going to give you there's ways to get a hold of me 
uh, and, and I'll give you, a, I'll just give you the coupon, whether you ever get anything from me or not, I'll give you the coupon for half off. So this would be half of this, which really makes sense if you're new to, to uh, testing for prop trading, because it may take you a month or two, okay? I did it in 10 days because I have experience and I, I know how to adjust and you know, probably nobody better to, to try to pass this thing cold than a guy who writes trading plans. So uh, anyway, so I wanna get off this screen and I wanna, I wanna give you some of the tips. I think you got a general idea. And again, I'm just trying to whet your appetite here. Then I want you to download the, um, uh, my white paper on it, which is only about four or five pages long, okay? Let, I wanna give you, this is a, a big, a, a, this is a big tip. Uh, this column left here is, is um, most trading firms. The one on the left, the right that I'm going to show you is Apex. Most people are going with Apex because there's only one, there's only one phase of testing. Once you make that three thousand dollars before you lose twenty five hundred, you've passed and you'll get funded with with uh, Top Step. And I choose these two because they're the biggest firms, Top Step and Apex. They're the biggest firms around, and they are known to pay out very consistently with everybody. There's no, I, I don't read any problems with them, um, and so. Because uh, there's a lot of fly by night places that do it too. So I'm showing you the probably the two biggest here. But in top step, if you have a fifty thousand, if you're testing for a fifty thousand dollar account uh, and you have a twenty five hundred dollar uh, trailing threshold, let's say you're in a trade and you have an open trade equity uh, of a thousand dollars. You're up a thousand dollars in the trade. Okay, now. Uh, your open equity gives you means that you've got fifty one thousand. It's not taken yet. It's not a. It's not. You haven't offset the trade. But you, right now, if you did offset the trade, you'd have fifty one thousand. You're up a thousand dollars on the trade. Okay. Then you the market comes all the way back, but you close out the trade to break, break even. This is this is what most frustrated traders do. They have a they have a a, a nice um, profit. They have dreams of 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 what that nice profit. This could be the big ten thousand dollars. They don't take the profit they don't they're always looking for more and as it comes down they say well i was a schmuck for not taking the what i had let maybe it'll come back looks like it's about to hit a support but i'll put my stop at break even this way i'm not a loser so anyway if you, let's say that happens to you and you back to break even well your trailing threshold in this case with apex with um with top step and most other firms remains 2500 it's a break even trade hey you had a, 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 a thousand uh, but but you gave it back, but that's okay. It's still twenty five hundred. With Apex, they hold that against you. Let me show. Let me show you where they hold open trade equity against you. Meaning that if you had a fifty thousand dollar account with Apex, you uh, have open trade equity of a thousand dollars, just the same way, and and then you let it come all the way back and you close out the trade at break even. With 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 Apex, now your threshold is down to fifteen hundred, because they. Count open trade equity against your your profit or your, your your threshold. This is huge. This is huge. So what does this mean? It means you've got to watch. You've got to take what God gives you when the market, to some degree, you've got to include a scalping element in order to do it right. I mean, most most of the traders that I talked to didn't even know the difference between the two, but they chose Apex because you only had to pass it once. With 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 uh, Top Step, you have to pass pass the same thing twice once you pass it you got to do it again and um so every give there's a take with these firms you know um but but how do you if you go with apex and i think that it has lower fees i showed you something for 167 dollars for a fifty thousand dollar account i think with apex it's more with the with top step it's more like 250 so apex is is less expensive uh fee wise but it's got this element of drawdown so if you're going to do this and take advantage of the of, of testing one time. You, you, I think you got to include scalping, okay? Because you don't want to get caught in, in in anything that does this to your threshold. So one of the remedies is you start with a multiple contract and scale out. Start with a with multiple contracts and scale out, okay? I like to start with at least two contracts. Let me just say before I start that that as a trader, um, one of the things that that I think traders don't give enough credibility to uh, as far as 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 risk and money management is con is the size of your um, is the size of the position that you're taking is position sizing okay so 
when I say multiple, con I go to the market and if I see a trigger that's an A plus trigger in the right environment, I'm going, I may take on five contracts or six contracts if I, in the futures market. This is all futures market, incidentally. They all test with the futures market. So uh, if, if it's a, if it's a, a trigger, but it's not in an environment that, that I think is the perfect environment, uh, then I, I'll, I'll take a minimum uh, position size, and that's two positions. But I always take multiple contracts. If I were testing here, and I did, as I mentioned to you, but I, in advising you, always take at least two contracts. Treat one as a scalp and one as a day trade, okay? Okay, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that in chart form. Okay, if you if 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 the if you measure the risk of a of a, a trade, and you should be measuring your risk every time you take a a, a, a trade, and, and that varies between people. Sometimes it's half a percent, sometimes one percent, some sometimes one or one and a half. You got to in 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 this uh, prop trading, you got to go toward the half a percent or one percent because you don't you, you can't get four or five in a row. You'll be knocked down. Okay, so. If you only have one contract, treat it as a scalp, not a day trade. So I'm, I'm, all I'm saying here with tip one is because of the way it's set up, and if you go to Apex, and, and it's good for any kind of trading, okay, take your scalp. Take the scalp and then use the other contract for lewd and lascivious profit. I, I'm, I'm also going to mention the fact that when you do this, when you take on one is a scalp and one is a, as, as a day trade, or if you take five contracts, three is a scalp and two is a day trade, um, you're gonna wind up eliminating the confusion that a lot of traders have about, should I, um, should I take this trade or, you know, what happens is um, when, you, when you take, when you're in a trade and it goes higher and goes, and goes a lot higher, you, and let it come back down. You wish you took the scalp, okay? And if if you take a scalp and and then the market goes much higher after that, you you wish you stayed in. So there's always a dilemma when, you, when you're dealing with one contract uh, about what you do. By by always having two contracts, you take out that dilemma because you're taking the low hanging fruit and you're allowing for some bigger profit. Okay, here are the three. I, I captured this uh, day before yesterday. So here's the three accounts that I'm trading. Uh, with with that now, I uh, in this in this account, this, this one is the two fifty. I'm up three thousand dollars. I've got to make fifteen thousand in this account to qualify. This is one. This is a hundred and fifty thousand dollar account. I'm focusing on this now. I want to pass this second. I'm up. I need nine thousand. I'm I'm uh, sixty percent there. I'm up five thousand in this account. This is from a, from a day's action. So this was a good day. Um, I try to, you know, it's a little tricky trying to trade di different accounts. I'm trying to figure that out myself. But so I focus on one. And then if I see a really good trade, I'll, I'll put them all in. This is actually funded. This is a funded account. The first day I traded it, um, I made a few hundred dollars. Uh, but I, the idea of having, if you're going to do prop trading, I think you got to think more long term from the standpoint of what am I in this for? And if you're in it for the long term, so to speak, and, and see it as something, why not have different streams of income. If you can pass one, you can pass all the different uh, element, all the different levels, okay? So when I pass all of these, when I pass all three, what'll happen is if I do something stupid and I make a mistake or I get caught in a trade in one of these and blow out one of the accounts, I still have income coming in from the other two, okay? So the idea of testing for multiple accounts, I know some traders that are in my group there, they're um, they're trading four, five, fifty thousand dollar accounts, and this way, if one gets they're more aggressive with one, it doesn't matter. They get blown out, they'll pass that one again. You got to go back to the testing. They know how to do that, but in the meantime, they're making income from the other. So multiple accounts just means you're going to um, you're going to be not be without an income or flow of money when you do it. So, uh, and I took these because I, I really think that um, the bigger accounts you can make more money. So, but I took the fifty originally to pass just because that's where most of my clients we're, we're looking at okay um apex's rules are i won't comment much on this except for to read them uh 100 you get 100 of the first twenty five thousand you make okay uh 10 day evaluation you, you you need to be testing for at least seven days okay i i happen to test for 10 in mine but and that's fine as long as it's over seven days you can test for two years if you want and you'll just keep paying the premiums, uh, the monthly charges, but the seven-day evaluation—they don't want to—they don't want you to passing it in two days. They don't want you to have a lucky trade. 
So the idea is that they want you to, to have your feet on the ground and be a consistent trader. Only 10 days for the first ongoing payments. Once you qualify, you only have to wait 10 days to start asking for your money. And they, they'll, you ask for your money and they'll pay you twice a month. And this is a good payout uh, scheme for most of these firms. Most of them pay every month. Uh, the the, the, most, the more they stretch it out, the more you can lose the money back. I guess, I don't know exactly why, but um, full ration micros, I showed you that where they count the micros as one tenth position to the total number of contracts that you're allowed to trade. And the one-time PA fee, when you do pass, there is a fee uh, because they, they're paying for your, uh, your data and so on. They charge you $80 a month. But if you want, they've, they've just instituted a one-time fee, meaning that uh, that they, you only have to pay $140 one time and not the monthly charge. And they do that because they know a lot of people that pass it are, were lucky and they're going to get blown out. And they're going to have to pass it again. So they might as well get $140 instead of $80. I know it sounds weird, but uh, that's the only reasoning I can come up with. Anyway, let's, let's look at have a frequent, reliable trigger. I'm, I, I'm limited to time, so I'm not going to go through, but the, I'm going to show you a frequent, reliable trigger. Um, Again, I always start with two contracts. We talk about that. But here's a frequently reliable trigger. This is the last thing I'm going to do. And I'm going to show you this trigger in action. In prop trading, it's important to have a, a frequent reliable trigger. Here's one that I use. I call it loaded gun. It's the name of our uh, the trading plan that I'd like you to use if you're going to do this. It's the same one that I use. This is an indecision bar. This is a five-minute bar. I usually trade off the five-minute candles. Could be 10, could be two minutes. Whatever you want. It works on all time frames. This is a hesitation candle followed by an extended candle that shows some power and interest in the market. And if that crosses a particular EMA, uh, uh, exponential moving average, and I use usually the eight or the nine, or I, I don't want to pin you to that. And I don't want you even trading based on what you see because you're going to get excited about this trigger when I don't go trading it without talking to me a little bit more first because there are, there are some environments that you don't want to be in this. So uh, when it passes through, when you have hesitation, and then you have a, um, a power candle passing through a particular moving average. That is a buy. You buy the market, you treat one as a scalp, and I always measure the body here. And I, my scalp is equal to this body. And so I'm, I'm putting my limit sell on one of those two positions here, putting my stop down here below the, the lower of the two. And then when, the mar when I take my profit on the scalp, I move my stop on the remaining position to break even. I know I talked fast, but let's get to some. I want to show you this in action because we only have. Enough, I only want to spend a couple of minutes on this. Here's a, here's yes. I took yesterday's charts. No cherry picking here. Here's the S and P. Here's the signal right here. This is the moving average. Okay. Here is the signal. Hesitation followed by a move through the moving average. Sell two here. Take your scalp at an equal distance here. You would have taken your scalp here. And then you would have moved your stop to break even. I can't get into, oh, here's another signal to go long. You would have gone long here and taken another scalp. Um, here's another signal here. Look, look at where, where it leads to the run. Now, of course, I don't want you to start doing this because you need to know the exit strategy, which is just as important. But I'll just tell you that we would have been out in this. We actually would have been out up here. And I'm going to, because if a market gets too far from the moving average, you want to grab it. Again, when you're being penalized for the market coming back at you for open trade equity, you've got to do some of the things that normally would you would consider doing. Now, with the, when you're tra prop trading, you got to do it. So when a market moves too far from the moving average, and then start, and then you know, moving too far, and now you have a, a shooting star, you better take your profit right here. You, God gave you all of this. Be a good, be a, a good person. Here's another signal. Okay. And where you got the nice scalp and some money. Here's a, look at this one. This is from yesterday's five minute chart. Don't go trading this based on what I'm showing you because you got to know how to exit. It's, always, it's not always like this. Okay. Here's another one that's, here's a loser. Okay. I showed you a loser. So always measure your risk. Followed by uh, something that just had the scalp, followed by another winner. Okay. Here's yesterday's Euro dollar. Okay. Let's look at some of the early in the morning. You got up at 6 30, you were paid off. Look at this. Uh, this is not a signal. Why? Because this is not enough hesitation. I want I want sleepy, and then I want move through. And here's an here's one right here that I I missed, but that would have been a losing position. You would have had it here, and then you would have been stopped out. Okay, you're going to get losers here. Winner, another nice winner. You got to measure the risk. Okay, so you may not be in this one. Got to, and we have uh, rules that that can get you in here. Um, Here's a losing trade, okay? So if you didn't measure risk, you just took a lot of risk. 
Okay, here's another winner. So you don't you see a mix of winners and losers, but look at the size of the winner. Look at the size of the loser. I'm just saying to you that there are things that you do, and one of them is a frequent, reliable trigger. Okay, I call it the loaded gun. And here's my offer to you today. Uh, how's my tune? Oh, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, the disciplinetrader.com forward slash prop win. I want you to have this report. It, it was featured on a Traders World magazine. Um, and um, I, I do a lot of articles for them. I think you do articles for them, Ken, too, don't you? Have you done, have you done uh, for Larry Jacobs? Uh, uh, not yet. I've, they've invited me. I've been, I, I write for Stocks and I know. Bodies, he's, but, he's but got a lot of, he, it sucks up seeing me. He always tells you, you know, that he needs something two days before. But um, mm -hmm. the, the, I want you to have this book, uh, this, this paper. It's only about five or six pages, but it'll give you a really clear uh, assessment of whether this is for you. Look, it's real. Uh, it is something that I may actually plan for my own retirement uh, because why not use their money instead of using yours if you know how to do it, but there are specific rules. So if you go to the disciplinetrader.com forward slash prop win, and at the back of this, at the end of this uh, um, piece of uh, work here, you'll see ways of getting a hold of me if you want to know some of the trading plans that I use and so on. Ken, thank you. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with people. Well, thanks for being here, Norm. You're one of the well-established people that I trust. And I know people, all the traders I know say good things about you. You've got a great uh, Discipline Trader Mastery program for uh, the psychology of trading. Highly recommend Norm Hallett. He's one of the established guys who's been around and knows his stuff. So uh, thanks so much, Norm. And you're certainly welcome to come back later in the year if you want. So thanks for being here. And, uh, Thank you, Ken. Always a pleasure, my friend. Okay, thanks, Norm. Take care, man. All right, well, next up, we've got Bennett McDowell from the Trainers Coach. Let me get Bennett on track here. Um, All right, Ken, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, let's uh, try to figure out how to get the controls back here. In the meantime, I'll just say hi to ben Bennett. How are yeah. you doing? Hi, Norm. How are you? Good to see great, you again. Great to see you. Great to see your name in print. <laughs> nice presentation. Thank you. Be well. All right, you too. All right, Bennett, I and mean, thanks, Norm. Appreciate it, man. Thanks for being here. Oh, sure, of course. All it's right, let me the get good set up here. As is Bennett McDowell. I've known Bennett for a really good presentation last time on the multi time frame analysis. That's always a, a good topic, uh, and and others. Uh, so, uh, everybody, uh, oh, welcome to. Yeah, Bennett McDowell is one of the good guys. I know Bennett and Gene for 15 years, something like that, a long time. Uh, he's one it's of the. Been a long time, hasn't it? It has. We're getting we're getting older, but hopefully a little better and, and wiser. And uh, and and you well, certainly hopefully right a little more uh, stiffness in the joints, though, Ken. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. But it's a uh, yeah. You're one of the good all guys. Right. So thanks uh, so much for being here, Ben and McDowell, and uh, everybody. You're in for a treat. Uh, as with all our speakers, they're really good people. So thanks for being here, man. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get going. Um, today we're going to talk about the Elliott wave, and I really consider it the roadmap of the markets. And of course, it's uh, present in nature as well. So we call it the universe too. But what I want to do is cover some of the basics of the Elliott Wave. And I also want to go back in history a little bit and talk about the guy who, who found it. Uh, and he didn't create it. He found it. He found it through observation. And his name was Ra Ralph Nelson Elliott. So we'll get into him. Uh, and of course, uh, before we do anything on the web, we have to, of course, let you know there's risks involved in, in trading. Past performance doesn't equal futures performance. But we want to make sure that you understand there is risk and to protect yourself against that. All right. Now, we also like to invite people to our website at traderscoach.com. We've got a lot of videos there, a lot of good free information. So drop on over, say hello to us, and uh, we'll be there. All right. So we've been doing, I guess, trade shows and stuff, and stuff with Ken, too, since about 1999. So it's been a while. We've been able to help quite a few people, um, not only with the Elliott Wave, but also to trade price action. We're big on that as well. I've also written several books. I've got my new book called The Art of Trading coming out uh, in this year. It should be out probably late this year. And it's the second edition. And we also have books on money management. And also my Elliott Wave book is here too. So that's available uh, at uh, Amazon. All right. Also too, since you took the time to get here, we want to make sure that you have a access to a free Elliott Wave cheat sheet. And so this is really good. Let me just put this in the chat area for you guys so you can have it. You can click on the link here. Okay, I just put it up there. So what we try to do on this uh, cheat sheet is give you clear definitions because there are some, there is some math behind the Elliott Wave. And so this kind of gives you a really good idea. 
And basically, we give you some illustrations of what patterns look like on a chart, uh, precise FIB target zones that we use. And it's really helpful. So, you know, download it. It's free and it's your gift for being here today. We always like to do that. All right, let's talk a little bit about Ralph Nelson Elliott, which, of course, his name is used in the Elliott Wave. He was born in 1871, so this is not a new form of technical analysis. We're going back in time here. He was an accountant, and he had an illness uh, back in about 1929 that put him in bed for quite a while. So when he was in bed, he always had a love for the markets, but he really didn't have time to get into it. But since uh, he had pretty much uh, nothing else to do at that time because he was in the hospital, he turned to the financial markets while recuperating. And he studied uh, all the charts, you know, back then they didn't have computers, so everything had to be uh, on paper. And he studied the stock market and the Dow theory in the 1930s. He ended up um, discovering what we call the wave principle or the Elliott wave in about 1938. So he spent about six years observing price patterns in the market. And so what he found is that Friends in the market, in the stock market back then, went in sequences of five. And basically, at the end of the fifth wave, the trend ended and changed direction. And he noticed this in enough times that it wasn't just by chance, and thus became uh, the probabilities of the Elliott wave. And then he did a final work called Nature's Law, and that was published in 1946, uh, outlining all this, and then unfortunately died in 1948. So one of the key things to take away from this is he really didn't create it. It was more of an observation that he made while looking at markets. And it's very similar to when you think about, you know, astronomers looking at black holes. They, they see it, they see matter getting close, get sucked in, but they don't necessarily understand all the mechanics of why it works. And I think we can draw a similar analogy to what uh, Ralph Nelson Elliott really found on the Elliott wave. He didn't necessarily know why it necessarily worked. Yes, it was a, a factor of greed and fear and profit taking, but the fact of exactly why it worked, he really didn't know. So we kind of classify that as an observational type of statistic. Now, why do we like to use it? Well, it's very helpful to know what market cycle you are you in. Are you in a bullish cycle? Are you in a just a temporary pullback and a trend that's not finished? Are you in a bear market cycle? Are you at the end of a major trend and perhaps the market is going sideways, getting ready to trend again? So all this can be answered helpfully by the Elliott wave. And it really is a form of technical analysis. It's not fundamental analysis in any uh, form. It really looks at mass psychology, fear and greed, of making money, taking profits, and then getting back in not to miss the next cycle. Uh, also, too, when you use Elliott Wave, there are these key waves create the zigzags of the market, and we can use those for not only risk to reward expectation calculations, but also for um, trade size calculations and risk control. So I call the wave theory really a roadmap of the market because it gives me a good overall view of where the markets have been and where they're going. So I think that's kind of uh, important and it takes into account crowd psychology. So one of the things that we can do now in modern day is we can take what Elliot really discovered and we call that the classic Elliot and combine it with computer power to create the modern Elliot wave theory. And when we talk about classic wave, what we're really talking about is price structure, when we're talking about the modern Elliott wave, we're talking about being able to measure momentum uh, at every given moment of the market, as well as volume, of course, and actually see the patterns forming, the fractal patterns forming in the market. He couldn't do that, all right, back in his time, but he could come up with the math behind the Elliott wave theory. And so really what we're gonna do here is take a look at both the classic and the modern. So let's start with the classic. So what Elliot basically noticed is that in a trend, there are five waves. At the end of the fifth wave, the trend ends and takes the opposite direction. So this is a bullish trend. Now notice there are one, two, 
three, four, five major waves outlined in this diagram. But then you can notice also that inside these waves, there are other waves. Now, one of the rules, and this is on the Elliott Wave Cheat Sheet that you wanna get, is that in the impulsive waves, there are five waves inside those waves. And the impulsive waves always move in the direction of the trend. So notice wave one, which really starts here and moves up. Then you have wave three, and then you have wave five. All of these waves are moving in the direction of the trend, while waves two and four are counter trend. So this is your profit taking. This is These are your pullbacks, but not a major change in the trend. And so this is what Elliot noticed is that during a trend, you have pullbacks, but in the impulsive waves, you also have five waves inside the impulsive wave. So there's our five there. Here's our five here on wave three. And here's our five here on wave five. He also noticed that during wave four and two, there usually was an ABC correction and at times, sometimes a complex correction, but it was different than the impulsive waves going in the direction of the trend. So now the next thing I wanna show you is that sounds really great on a slide, but can you really see this on a chart, right? So the next chart I'm gonna show you is an actual chart from Apple a few years back. And why I love this chart so much is, is because it allows you to see the major impulsive waves, but also the waves inside the impulsive waves, as well as the waves in the corrections, which is waves two and four. And so let's just walk through this really quick. So here's your wave one, and here are the smaller waves inside, and then your ABC wave two correction for profit taking, and then a big move up wave three. Now, one more thing in terms of the classical approach to Elliott wave is that wave three is gonna be your strongest wave of the five. It's gonna have the highest momentum and it's gonna also have the highest volume. And the mood inside wave three is gonna be exciting, dramatic, and at times manic in the direction of, it, of its move. So if it's a bullish, Wave three, everybody's going to be very excited. Um, we saw this back, remember, in the dot-com era of the 1990s. That was right near the top of a wave three. You had everybody day trading. You had the dot-coms, et cetera. And then you had, of course, the big crash, the technology crash after that. So it's, it's very interesting because in a wave or in these impulsive bullish waves up, the market tends to ignore bad news and accentuate the good news. And vice versa, if it's a trend down, you're going to find the move change to one of pessimism, all right? So after wave three, more profit taking, okay? And then you get the final move up, which is wave five. And what's interesting on wave five is the enthusiasm. Uh, it's just not as exciting. And a lot of that is because um, usually wave four uh, can really burst the bubble of people that got in late on wave three. And so therefore they're kind of discouraged and you don't have that much excitement going into wave five. So that's kind of the Elliott wave in a nutshell in terms of a major bullish trend in the classical approach. So um, one more important aspect that he noted is that because you have these waves inside the waves, there are also waves of different degrees. So for example, if you're looking at a monthly chart, like in this example, if you go out to the yearly chart, you see this monthly major move here, all right? It's just the beginning of a next major move, perhaps on the, on the yearly chart. Likewise, if you go to a monthly chart, same type of thing. And we see this a lot on the time frames that we trade, not only for position trading, where we are looking primarily at the daily time frame, but if we go to the 60 minute time frame, we can see the Elliott wave count there. You can see it on the daily and you can see it on the weekly. And then you can see how they all fit together to give you that overall look or roadmap of what I call of the market. We also do this on the intraday timeframes when we day trade, you know, we run a day trading room. So I got a usually um, uh, one minute is my primary. I have a 15 second 
as my uh, smaller time frame, and then we have the five minute as our larger time frame. But again, because of the fractal symmetry of the market, what we see is the same type of configuration with the Elliott wave between the different time frames, no matter what they are. So it's kind of interesting aspect. The other thing too to note, and this is kind of going to be interesting, is that when we talk about the corrections being an ABC, you have to think of them in this way. When a market has finished a impulsive wave and corrects, like at the end of wave one or three, all right, the first move down now is heading down towards the major wave two. So technically, A wave is considered an impulsive wave in wave two, only in wave two, not in the overall trend. So inside A wave, you're going to have, that's right, five waves because it's impulsive wave. And then you have a brief pull up, which is your ABC correction. And then wave C, all right, has again, five waves because it's an impulsive wave going in the direction of wave two and usually ending wave two. And the same thing with wave four. So it's kind of interesting. So whenever you look at a wave count and you see an impulsive wave uh, going in a major direction on one time frame, you may have five waves down on another time frame, even though it's counter trend to the major time frame. And that's why, okay, because of this particular uh, situation. And here's where you can actually see it both in a bearish and bullish trend. So when we talk, we talk a lot about bullishness here, but just flip it, okay? And it's the same theory for the bearish trends as well. All right, so um, a lot of people will say, you know, um, that's fine and dandy, but you know, one of the major crit criticisms of the Elliott wave is that it can feel it's subjective. And I get that, but I gotta tell you, if you start combining that with the modern approach, you can take that subjectivity out of the wave counting, and that will lead us to what we want to talk about next. So um, when I look at basically adding the modern approach to the classical approach, what I'm kind of doing is taking what Elliot did and then having my computer help me in such a way using certain indicators at the bottom to confirm what I'm seeing on the chart. And that really increases the probability of that wave count being accurate. So I think that's real important to do that. And so I look at a whole uh, bunch of things. You can look at, for example, I use a histogram that measures momentum. We call that the OWL. And the OWL histogram, which stands for Optimum Wave Locator, always will be the highest during an Elliott Wave 3. All right, so right away I can tell when I'm looking at the history, if there's some moves up, I can take a look and see which one had the highest momentum and chances are that one will be the Elliott wave three. All right. And then we take a look at um, situations like if we're in a correction and we see maybe a pennant or something of that nature, uh, that is usually occurring during a complex correction in one of the waves two or four. So we look at a lot of little different things to create what I call a probability matrix of the accuracy of the wave count. And then the next question is, okay, well, using all this stuff, um, does it work and can you make money? Well, here's an example of it, again, on, on a real chart here. And notice here, this is the owl here, which is measuring momentum. So it's going to be the highest when you have wave three. And that, of course, was here. Then you had your ABC correction. And then you had wave five here. And wave five, the owl has got to be lower than the wave three owl. So you have to have bearish divergence on an uptrend between wave five and wave three. That's a rule. And during this area here for wave three, all right, you have to have the highest momentum. Then the next thing is when the owl or momentum turns bearish, that's your indication that you are in a wave four. So a major wave four has to have a bearish owl. And so when we see that turning bearish, we then can draw our FIB retracements and develop a high probability wave four target zone, which is roughly between 61.8 and 38.2%. So usually 70% of the time, Elliott waves is retraced to there. 15% a little shallow, 50% a little deeper. But one of the rules is that a wave four correction can never go inside wave one. So as soon as that happens, it's not a wave four, probably it's a wave two on a grander scale. So in a case like this, 
once you get to this area here, then you're ready to trade wave five, okay? These little P's and all this kind of stuff, don't pay attention to that right now because that is our trading system. What I want you to do is just grasp the overall Elliott wave situation here, the roadmap. So let's think for a minute. Let's say we're getting a breakout from a bottom. Really at this particular point, you're not gonna know if this is a wave three or not. But you, if you look at the history before that breakout, that may give you a clue because if you can see the bottom of either a wave, a corrective wave four, or a, in other words, an ABC correction, or the end of a wave five down, and you've been bottoming for a while, then you know the next move up, the next trend up is going to be significant because it's a change in trend. And so you definitely don't want to miss the new movement once it breaks out of the channel. Now, if you showed up, let's say in this time frame here, okay, well, you can very quickly see that this is the largest owl. This is the most slopiest, <laughs> slopiest um, trend. And so therefore this is gonna be a three. And if you've had your ABC correction, grab your FIB retracements and you may have a trade for wave five. So just because you miss wave three, don't throw the towel in because you still have the chance of a wave five trade. All right, so again, by knowing where wave three is, then you can orient yourself to what the market is doing currently. Here's another one, um, great example again, because you know, here's your breakout from your channel, all right? We go up, wave three, ABC, four, and five target zone. Owls bullish, owls bearish, owls bullish, bearish divergence, and there you have it. And then these little movements in here, okay, are all the waves inside um, the major wave three. So from wave two to wave three. So you've got something like a one, two, three, four, five. There's your, there's your five waves right inside there. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Now, sometimes you have to go to a lower time frame to actually see those more clearly. So for example, daily chart, you maybe have to go to a 60 minute chart to kind of look at those a little more clearly. But anyway, they are there, okay? And here's one on a bearish trend. And again, notice here, this is kind of uh, not as clear, but here's where the owl helps us. Three, four, five, and we're still bearish, still staying short in this example. And this indicator here called the precision trend filter says wave five is not over yet. So in that case here, all right, we'd stay short, all right, until um, wave five ends, all right, or until this goes green. And so that's how we would play that. Now, here's a great chart going back quite a ways. Uh, Ken and I will be aging ourselves because we'll, we'll, we'll remember this. But uh, back in the year uh, 2000 um, and leading up to 2000, late 1990s, you know, you could not go to a cocktail party uh, and not be talking about stocks. Everybody was day trading. Um, everybody was thinking, you know, the dot com era was here to last. I know I was at Morgan Stanley at the time. and the analysts um, there, uh, fundamental analysts were saying, well, times are different now because technology is different. So tell your clients that technology is making this a different type of market now. However, the Elliott wave was saying, uh-uh, not so quick, all right? This is a wave three and it's getting extended and here's wave three, four, five. So, you know, you can grab your FIB extensions and go one, two, three, we're looking at a target here and boy, did that hit it. All right, and then of course the dot-com bubble burst. All right, and the market sold off. The FIB retracements for this one was right in this category here. We were already in here. Things were still pretty negative, so it looked like it was gonna go deeper. And sure enough, it went to 7,300 and then rebounded and went high from there. So, but on a lot less enthusiasm. In fact, I can remember we got kind of up above here and people were very like, you know, okay, it's a stock market, big deal, okay? It wasn't like it was back here. What's interesting also in that time period is 9-11, the terrorist attack, is the thing that drove it down, okay, to those levels. Now, that's the other weird thing about the Elliott wave. Sometimes you wonder, how the hell is it gonna get to these certain levels? And it's amazing because, again, bad news is accentuated, and that was really bad news. So that really brought it down. 
Uh, so in a change in trend like that, in a, in a corrective area, like a wave four, the bad news is somewhat uh, accentuated. So that's what happened in here. All right. So any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, I'm coming. I, I don't want to run over here, but uh, I do want to make sure everybody has a fairly comprehensive view of the basics of the Elliott wave. Now, there's a lot more to it than this because you can go into complex corrections that are more extended, of course. But um, I want to kind of try to keep it basic, for especially for those new folks out there, and kind of bring you on board and get you interested here. Okay, so uh, definitely think about asking me any questions and please download this uh, uh, free cheat sheet because there's a lot of good information on that as well. So Ken, I see your mic, your, your cam is on here. Do you remember back in the 19, late 1990s, um, everybody was day trading? Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, I remember like pets.com or Qualcomm, uh, Yahoo had like a 17 point run and uh, let me ask you a question, yeah. though. Uh, in service of what you excellent presentation, Bennett, um, one of the things that I like best about the way that you approach Elliott is it gives traders uh, clarity in terms of, how to say, a template or instead of a big blank white spot on the right side of the chart, you've got the expectancy set up ahead of time. So, you know, when you start to see, hey, there's a wave two correction now. I'm equipped to know whether whether there's an owl or there's going to be a pivot on a wave four, or you've got a you've got a right. template of what to expect versus just hey I don't know it's all blank over there who knows but the Elliott wave approach that you you identify the way you develop it Bennett I really like because it gives traders expectancies and specifics in terms of a template of kind of how to follow things that's very helpful yeah well thank you you know that um, was something I developed over the years using it uh, because in the beginning. You know, I stumbled through it like most other people. And um, what I found was lacking was how to really add some probabilities to the outcome. Right. And the way in which we incorporated momentum, bearish divergences between five and three. Mm -hmm. And also, too, just the simple uh, FIB extensions and retracements. You know, if you have a, a pullback, a wave four, and you're thinking about going on a wave five, well, it really helps to know the right timing so you mm -hmm. don't get stuck on possibly a wrong bottom for wave four right. and the fib retracement levels okay is one of the dots we connect and then of course you have to have momentum uh like we use on the owl turning uh bullish again uh to confirm that so what i learned is it's a, a lot of connecting of the dots it's also just plain getting a good visual once you know where wave three is mm -hmm. then you can piece it all together both forward and backwards and also, too, just because you don't know if you're going into a wave three on the new trend, you can go back in history and see what the last major wave three was. And right. chances are it was on a bearish downtrend. And so from there, you can see if the five waves on the bearish trend before had ended. And so therefore, now, you know, you're getting ready for another change in trend. So all that kind of right. stuff um, is all connecting the dots. Right, right. It's like your approach is great because it gives traders kind of signposts of what to look for. So they're not just out there in the fog, but you give very clear, you know, how to decision support so that you're, you know, kudos to you, Bennett. You're one of the good guys. And uh, you that's, oh, that's my you, biggest man. takeaway is that it gives traders some clarity instead of confusion. You can use that. That's a good hook. Clarity versus confusion. You have clarity yeah. on, on the on the right side of the chart, which is we all need. So thanks. That's a good one. It all helped. Clarity with probability. Um, yeah. The other thing too is sometimes Ken will look at markets and they're a mess. I mean, yeah. they're very volatile, they're up and down. And chances are what you're looking at there on the time frame you're looking is you probably are, are in a complex correction on a higher time frame, mm -hmm. which is creating that volatile volatile mess. So when I see mm -hmm. that, if I don't see a clear Elliott wave, I move on. That's smart. Yeah. Knowing when to when to engage versus when to stay clear until you get a signal that's actionable. So that's exactly, good stuff. Exactly. So everybody, I highly let, let me just quickly tell. answer. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, hold on. I'm getting a couple things here. Let me just, uh, I'm, I'm just, Ken, give me a second. I'm just looking at the chart. I don't want to run over today. All right, put the link up. I guess Gene was asking me to do that. Um, Timothy is saying gold is near the end of wave three on a daily. Can you check, please? I don't have my um, chart up, but actually I'm going to tell you the wave three um, gold occurred on the weekly chart in 2011. So we are in a wave five on gold. I think the target's around 201 and higher. And on that particular chart, you're right. 
on the daily, we're in a wave three inside a wave five. So it's going to appear as a wave three on a daily. But the wave five um, target, the wave five will be a final end to gold's up move on the weekly chart. So we're not there yet, but um, it is getting closer and closer to the target. And, and it's looking pretty good. All right. Thanks, Bennett. Appreciate it, man. And you're always welcome back anytime, you know, your friend. So, and you help people. So <laughs> that's what I'm looking for. So appreciate you being here, man. Oh, thanks, Ken. And, and I just want to tell everybody one last thing too, you know, give Ken a lot of hand. I mean, he, he, Ken, you, you have done such a good job with your series here. And I got to tell you, I do a lot of these. He's the most organized person I have ever met <laughs> really? in doing this. So kudos to you, seriously. Well, thanks. I want to give good value to the traders and bring in top-notch people like you and our next speaker, Marina, uh, in front of uh, audience with the 30-minute, you know, nice focused, you know, it's a nice bite-sized chunk and you can get a lot of knowledge and content in just a few hours from top-level people. It's a win-win for us all. So thanks, Ben. Yeah, appreciate it, man. You and Gina. It's a great format. Yeah. All right. right. Thanks, Ben. Bye-bye. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Hey, Marina, uh, good to see you here. We have next Marina, the trader chick, coming up and she's really uh, well-received uh, from our last session. So I'm bringing Marina back. Marina, welcome aboard. I'm trying to make you a, a co-host and a presenter, and hopefully you can uh, present and share your screen. So welcome aboard. Hi, Ken. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually been looking really f looking forward to being here today. Yeah, I liked what you, you were sharing last time about uh, avoiding inside consolidation. That helped me uh, not overtrade inside consolidation and save me some money. So thanks. It's a Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it, it works. So it, 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 honestly, it really helps. So it's it's good. I need these nudges. Uh, so I did make you the co-host, so you should be able to present your screen. Uh, you oh, click, uh, click on where yes, it's the green share screen and then pick one and you should be good to go. Okay. Yes. Hang on just a second. Looks good. All okay. Right. Are okay, you able so to see my screen? I am. So traders, awesome. without further ado, let me introduce Marina Cooperman. She's very helpful uh, and uh, very interesting. I like what she had to teach last time, the trader chick, simplifying day trading. She had some very useful techniques uh, of which one really helped save me some money this past few weeks. So uh, Marina Cooperman, the trader chick, uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. And thanks so much, everybody, for taking your time out this Saturday. I know Saturdays can be a little bit tricky at times, so I'm happy that you guys are all here. And yeah, I would actually love to know because I'm looking to see and it's a really huge turnout. Where are you guys coming from? Let me know where you guys are coming from. I would love to know where in the world are you? So don't be shy. Let's use the chat box. I don't know if you guys know where the chat box is. You could just put it in right here. And let me know from South Carolina, David. Daniel is from Phoenix, John is from North Carolina, Timothy is from Australia, very early hours, I'm sure, right? Leland is from Cleveland, Juanita is New Jersey, Tony from Florida Keys, I love Florida Keys. Hi, Marina, hi, Agnes from Chicago, well, great to meet you guys. Raymond, you're from Northern Ireland, very cool, very interesting, it's the first time I've had anyone from Northern Ireland, quite a lot of Irish people that love to trade and whatnot, but welcome. I'm super happy to be here, here with you guys. Richard from England, East Essex, very cool. Stroke is from Austin. So we have a very international crowd. I love it because it shows me that, you know, that's the cool thing about trading is that you can literally do it from anywhere in the world. And the fact that we are all connected through online today. I mean, this is just, I personally think it's one of the most incredible things. So thanks everybody for being here. I do just want to say a really quick thing. I am here to present for you guys, but I know that the reason why you guys are here is because you want to learn something. And a lot of times I find that if you have questions, that that's when we learn better, right? So there is never a bad question. All questions are great. And a lot of times, People think, oh, it's a bad question, but then they ask a question and somebody else is like, oh, that's right. I had this question too. So don't be shy. Ask away. I will answer all of your questions. That's literally my goal. So I'm really excited to present for you guys. Now, what I want to talk about today is four steps how to simplify your day trading, right? The thing is with day trading and in, in the financial markets, it's easier to make it seem complicated, right? Because when you make something seem complicated, the person who's making it seem complicated, I, I don't know, I feel like they 
feel better about themselves and whatnot. And they used to really be a struggle for me because I couldn't understand so many things. And then one day I just realized that it's actually not as complicated as we think it is. And this is my way of helping you guys just to simplify your trading, because once you can see that it is actually quite simple, I guarantee you will go to the next level. And this is me. I am Arena, the trader chick. And so interestingly enough, I'm just going to do a little quick intro because it's always good to know who is actually the person talking. And I am an expat. And right now I am still an expat in Antigua, Guatemala. We've been now living here for 14 years. We were expats in Costa Rica. But as of next week, we are going to be moving to Barcelona, Spain. So next time, Ken is going to have this great summit. I'm going to be talking to you guys from Spain. So I'll just be moving over to Spain. I know that um, every time I present and tell people that I'm an expat, I've been an expat in Central America, now I'm going to be an expat in Spain, which is a very complicated process. Regardless, a lot of people really want to also be expats. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions, but probably better if you want to just email me, you could just email me at thetraderchick at gmail.com. But I'm happy to answer all your questions. Tons of people usually come to me because they always you know, aspire to be expats as well. Anyways, before I became a day trader, I was actually a fitness instructor. And the reason I bring that up is because a lot of people believe that they have to have a math background or financial background, and none of that is true. And I was also a travel writer, and I still am, actually. I still have a travel site, which is my first baby online. So, you know, you could do anything and trade as well. And that's the beauty of it. I'm also trilingual. And the main reason I bring up that I'm trilingual, not to tell you, wow, look at me, I'm trilingual. It's because being trilingual, I recognize that the markets, they actually have a language. They speak their own language. And when I started to look at it as a learning as a new language, it totally changed everything for me. And I'm hoping that you guys will be able to identify that as well, because once we start to understand what the market is actually saying to us, then we can work with the market rather than try to beat it or predict it, because that will never, ever work. And the coolest thing about trading, guys, we could do it from anywhere in the world, right? That is the absolute greatest part about trading. And before I uh, the pandemic, I used to actually do a lot of these presentations live in person, especially in like the money show traders expos, I did quite a few of them, but then the pandemic hit and I realized that I actually am able to speak to a lot more people with online presentations so I find them to be a lot more productive. So let's get into the basics of day trading, which is really the reason why we could simplify things is that makes it also fun to have while trading. You know, it's interesting, like when you drive a car, we get in and we just do automatic stuff, right? We get in and there's just these automatics. We know where the brakes are. We know where the rear view mirror is. We know where everything is, but we forget that it wasn't automatic at one point for us, right? We learned every one of those things. And it's the same thing with trading. When we have certain automatic things that are happening for us, like understanding the most basic language, all of a sudden we can start to build a foundation because I'm noticing that so many people that want to trade don't really have any foundation. And what I actually say is that we put in windows before building our walls and then the windows keep on crashing. And we always wonder why are they crashing? Because we don't have the basics down, the foundation. Now, before we go any further, I actually made a free cheat sheet for you guys, a free worksheet that goes completely along with this presentation. It's totally free. Go here right now. Makingofadaytrader.com. Makingofadaytrader.com. Go there right now, guys. It's totally free and you can get the presentation with you. Richard, um, are you orthodox? I'm not really sure what that means. What do you mean orthodox? Okay, guys. So go here. Makingofadaytrader.com. So let's begin with the foundation. Let's start to build our foundation. Market movement, the breakdown of trends. Look, we all know that there are three trends, right? There is the upward trend, downward trend, and then there is the sideways trend. So as Ken was saying, when you can recognize the sideways trend, 
the amount of money you will save yourself will be incredible. And on top of that, you're going to be able to spot the best trades out there. So that is the super important part of it all, okay? Is that recognizing the sideways trend. But just so we kind of get the understanding of it all, what is an upward trend? It's literally when each pivot is higher than the next and it is when you are entering to buy or go long. And basically simplifying it, it's you're entering at a lower price point, exiting at a higher price point and you're taking the profit in between. What is a downward trend? It's the opposite, right? It's each pivot is lower than the other. You are looking to enter a short. You are selling. What does that mean? You are entering at a higher price point, exiting at a lower price point, and you're taking that money in between. And if you're sitting here saying, well, you know, <clears throat> I'm not going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, shorting or selling, you know, that's too emotional, but it's not. If you're doing your technical analysis, you don't care what anything else is happening because the market is showing you this is where you can make money. So once you open up your mind and look at the market, shorting or going long, you will start to win so much more. Now, I really want to jump in and talk about the consolidation areas, those transitional areas. I literally call them the trader's worst enemy. And once you know how to spot them and avoid them, you will be able to just literally take your trading to the next level. And that I am 100% sure of once you are able to recognize these areas and stay out of these areas. So what are these consolidation areas? These are called sideways markets, channeling markets, indecision zones, exhaustion patterns, the chop. I don't care what you call it. It's all the same thing, okay? So what does that mean? When you're going down trend, uh, for instance, downtrend, or it could be uptrend, and all of a sudden, it just slows down. It's sideways. It's flatlining. Does that mean it's about to transition and go into a new trend? Does that mean it's going to break out? Who knows? That is not for us to know. What it is for us to know is that we stay out entirely. All right. When we see consolidation markets forming in these types of areas, we stay out. We don't touch. And I will be showing you guys how to spot these areas so that you can stay out entirely. All right. Why do we end up losing money in these areas? Have you guys ever thought of the reason why so much of our money gets lost in consolidation areas? I'll tell it to you why. Because we create stories. I don't know if you guys understand what I mean by stories, but I'll give you an easy example. Imagine you just met somebody, it could be a new friend or a new intimate, you know, romantic partner, whatever. And, you know, you're excited to hang out with them more. And they say to you, hey, I'm having a party in a couple of days. Would you like to come? And you're like, oh, yeah, for sure. They're like, okay, I'll write you tomorrow and let you know. The next day comes and goes. They never write to you. And all of a sudden, your mind starts to create stories. And unfortunately, humans, we create negative stories. So your mind starts to create this story. Oh, my God. Maybe they don't like me. Did I say something wrong? Maybe they spoke to somebody else and said that I was coming and they decided not to invite me again. All these stories, right? Making you feel bad about yourself. The next day, this person calls up. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I dropped my phone in the toilet. I could not get my contacts back until today. So there was no story, right? It was completely created. This is what happens when we see consolidating markets. We create stories. How? There are two types of traders out there. There is the trend is your friend trader. And when they see the market like this, they're like, you know what? The market has been going up all day. I'm going long. Then there's the contrarian trader. They're looking at the market. They're like, you know what? The market's been going up all day. It's going to correct. I'm shorting the market. Here's the reality, guys. Their phones fell in the toilet. There is no, is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? What is is that there is nothing. It's a flat line. And you as the pro trader have to sit out and wait until the market tells you otherwise. So once you spot that consolidation, you leave, you get out, you stay out until the market gives you a confirmed movement, either changing direction or breaking out. Now let's talk about those areas because those areas are the most important areas, right? I literally call the support and resistance areas, the seat belts, the protective gear. So imagine, I want you guys to think of Formula One racers, right? 
every one of us here knows about Formula One. I don't care if you like it, don't like it, but you know what it is, right? It's a pretty risky uh, car race. It is a known fact amongst the racers that 25% of them will either have a massive injury or a fatality. So when they get into their cars, do you think they're just going to hop in and press on the pedal and go 200 kilometers an hour? Absolutely not. They're going to get their helmet on. They're going to have their fireproof uniform on. They're going to put their seatbelts on when they're inside the car because they're protecting themselves. 95 to 98% of people that say they want to trade fail. And how do they fail? They lose money because they don't have any seatbelts on them. Support and resistance are your seatbelts. So what is a support area? It is the seal, the floor. It is the floor of the market. So the market's been going, let's say, down really well. And all of a sudden, it started to hit an area over and over again. That is your seatbelt. It is telling you, do not go any further. I'm protecting you. Draw it in. And if you continue here, you will not lose money. Okay, support area. It is the floor of the market. And you could outline your channels with the support and resistance area. What's a resistance area? It is the ceiling of the market. When the market's been going up and boom, it starts to hit an area. And here's the thing, guys. The market respects areas. They respect the areas. So it revisits those areas. Meaning if you get into a trade, thinking that you could outdo the resistance area, even though it's a strong move, it could hit that wall and boom, turn on you faster than you are able to manage it. You need to draw these areas in. Every single person who wants to be a professional trader, you need to have a good software. I don't care what your software is. There are so many good softwares out there right now, but you need to have a proper charting platform, which gives you the drawing tools, it gives you free universal indicators. So you need to draw it in. You cannot have mental drawings. It will never work. Mental drawings, mental stops, they're like literally mental seatbelts, right? It's like pretending that you're going to be able to save your baby without the seatbelt because you're going to be the mental seatbelt during an accident. You need to draw these in, guys, because that's the most important thing. Now, here's the reality. How do we spot these areas when they're first starting? And that I call reversal areas and divergences. I don't call them. This is the nature of them. That's what they are. Okay, what are they? They are double tops, triple tops, double bottoms, triple bottoms, even head and shoulders. They're already telling us that there is a slowdown. There is a weakness in the market. And that's what we need to focus on, right? So when we're seeing reversal patterns, you need to already stay out because the market is telling you, hey, you know what? I'm losing strength. Do you really want to be in a market that's losing strength? Do you really want to bet on a horse that is running a race that you could totally tell that is really slowing down? No, you want to wait until it either gets its energy or not even be in that trade at all. That is so important. And what is divergence? So as you can tell right here, my price action is flat yet my divergence is going upward. Divergence to me is my holy grail. It is literally my holy grail. I am able to fully see when the market is starting to slow down and I don't wanna be anywhere near that market. I'm super, super conservative. So, and you know what? It's hard earned money. Why do I wanna put the money into a market where there's no real strength? Okay, you guys need to spot those areas because those areas, and they're easy to spot. They're easy, and you know the best part about it? They are free. You do not need to buy any algorithm or software or flashy new indicator because they're right there, and they are spotted on any instrument that you are trading. Now, let's talk about those breaking out of areas because when you are able to focus on the areas, draw those areas, then you can start to find the most profitable area, most profitable trades. And the breakout trade is one of the most profitable trades out there. So what is a breakout? Super simple to understand. You are here, you're driving, all of a sudden there is a massive construction area. You have to go flat, you're freaking out. Is it gonna reopen? Are the roads gonna reopen? 
oh my goodness, what's happening? Oh, boom, they reopened the road in the same direction. So a breakout is when you're going in the same direction, there has been a flat area, a detour, and you are continuing on that area. So let's put it all together. First and foremost, before you go anywhere, remember, you need to have a platform. Think of a Formula One driver. You cannot be a Formula One driver without a professional car. You cannot be a trader without good, strong software. Whatever your software is, I'm happy to help you if you guys don't know which is the best charting software, but it usually works with what are you trading, right? Like if you're trading crypto, you want to be in a, in a charting software that works well with crypto. Are you trading futures? You want to be with futures equities. So that will also help you gauge which software to start to looking for. Now, remember, like I said, my entire presentation that I'm doing right now, you could get it here, making of a day trader dot com making of a day trader dot com okay so let me see question or dogs in mainstream christian religion making knows another tend to rule um i'm not uh i'm not really understanding why that matters um my my religious background has absolutely nothing to do with trading but trading view is a very good platform so if you guys have questions about platforms, I'm definitely happy to answer all of that and about trading in specific. Again, please go here, makingofadaytrader.com, makingofadaytrader.com. Okay, so here we are. Let's talk about the breakout trade setup. Guys, here's the thing. The reason why I bring up Formula One, because there is so much adrenaline pumping for Formula One racers, right? And we get that. We understand that. However, next time you're in the live market, do a little quick test for yourself. See the amount of adrenaline that is pumping through you because I don't care how much of a pro you are or if you're just beginning, you are pumping that adrenaline because it's that kind of an activity. So the thing with trading is you can look to the left to know if you have made the right decision. That means you're drawing in the areas. That means you're understanding what is actually happening. That means you're seeing if there's divergences, right? That means you can calm down because you know your adrenaline state of mind, you can't think properly. That's why you also need to have a mental stop in there and drawings because your adrenaline will eventually win over with the ego and the ego will be like telling you all these wrong things, either greed or telling you to stay in when the trade is bad. We've all been there, right? You need to have these areas drawn in. This is how I spot the breakouts. So as you can see, I personally use the MACDs as my indicator. And I personally love the MACDs because it is the, I think it's the least lagging indicator out there. So it's also telling me when there's a lot of weakness or strength. This da dash or dotted line, it's the zero line. It means that there is very little strength in the market but then boom when it goes all the way here that's showing me massive strength and no divergence that's when i am totally getting into that trade now another trade setup the initial reaction trade setup i call it also you have to have your areas drawn in you have to understand when the momentum has changed you have to be able to read the market and interestingly enough it's not hard it's quite simple right so what is the initial instant reaction trade? It's just the name that I gave it. But basically it's like this, right? Imagine you want to go jogging and you and you have friends want to bet on you. So right, you're putting on your clothes, your, your shoes, and you're out the door. That's the most amount of energy that you're going to have. So if I'm going to bet on you, that's going to be the best time for me to bet on you, right? Because that's when you have the most amount of energy energy to run fastest. But then like in you know 30 minutes, an hour into your job, do I really want to be betting on you? Not so much. New trends have the most amount of energy and support to push that trend in the beginning. And that's why I love to be able to try and get in as early as possible into a new trend because that's when you can make the most amount of money. But that means you have to read what the market is telling you. And the market talks to you about that. Okay, guys. So again, go here, making of a day trader 
gmail.com. You can get the entire cheat sheet for free. Okay. Making of a day trader.com. Um, oh, Avengers, because I'm from Russia. I'm actually from the Soviet Union. I arrived during the Cold War. So technically, I am a Jew uh, because only Russian Jews were permitted out during that time. So there you go. However, I don't really hey, Marina. Uh, have any religious background. Anyway, Marina, yeah. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation. I wanted to uh, ask another question related to trading. Um, uh, and just to re relay the fact that you really helped me. Uh, keep my mind focused on not trading inside consolidations. You know, problem is for like those of us who old dogs been doing this, uh, you know, I'm like a trading junkie. I, I over trade you know, habitually and the worst place where I lose the most money is over trading inside consolidation. So thanks a lot for the, uh, you know, the, the reminder to avoid consolidations because I kept that in mind and it did keep me out of over trading uh, this past week or two. So it was very helpful. And you have a lot of other good insights too. Uh, I like the seatbelt analogy. Uh, you've got a lot to share with the traders. So you're, very helpful and very useful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions. Do you always wait for the MACDs? I do. I wait for the MACDs to cross over the 0 0.3 line. So, uh, hang on one second here. Um, yeah, like here. So, I like to see it go 0 0.3 either below or above. Jack, your charts have lots of averages. What are your favorites? So, I use three EMAs. I use the 20. 52 and the 135. Hmm. My 52 is my main one. And my 20 is where I take some of my trades off of it and the 52. But I use the 135 for a very specific trade that I call the magic, uh, magic zone trade. So uh, to be honest with you, I guess all three of them are really important for me. And they're all my favorites. I've literally narrowed it down to two indicators now after having over 10. And a lot of them are really you need to, if you guys have too many indicators, I recommend kind of going back and process of elimination, seeing which ones work best for you so that you don't um, overstress or go into analysis paralysis. <laughs> Just my little thing. I totally agree. Good point. Keep it simple. One or two indicators is all you need to be a good price action trader. So thanks. Yeah, Marina, you're one of the good people out there. So thanks. It's a very valuable. I, I thoroughly enjoy your presentations. It, uh, puts me in a good mood and has me nodding my head. Yes, yeah, she's right. Traders need to know this stuff. So thanks. It's uh, good content. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, Agnes, I use the 610 tick chart. I don't use time frames as far as minutes. I use tick charts, which are really common. But 610 is probably around one or three minute uh, time frame if you don't have tick chart available. All right, guys. Well, thank you so very much. If you have any more questions, I am happy to answer all of them. And again, go to makingofadaytrader.com and you can get my free cheat sheet, everything that I just went through, and you can go over it on your own. And thank you so much, Ken, again. And I'm looking forward to the next time. Yeah, thanks. Thank Me you. too. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. I always appreciate it. <laughs> thanks. All right. Well, it's Bye, gonna... everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Richard. Bye. Thank you, everybody. You know, um, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks traders for being here. We will try and get the, uh, um, let me, um, Marina, can you, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. I can stop the, yeah, I can stop the share. Okay, thanks. There and you let go. Me, thanks traders and let me get back to it here. Um, wanted to thank you guys for being here. Let's take a, yeah, great presentation. Yeah, appreciate it folks. Uh, good job. Let's see. One thing I want to wrap up for everybody is thanking you folks for being here for our, our success summit. And I will be getting the video out to you guys coming up soon. Um, can you guys, a quick uh, question, can you guys see the screen okay? I wanted to wrap up with a, a few parting thoughts before we end the day. Let's see. I'm trying to get this. <clears throat> 